For 35 years, they have wondered what happened to Aaron. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Aaron Anderson. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Aaron Anderson was just 22 months old. He was born June 23rd, 1987. He was born to Steve and Paulette Anderson, and they lived in a relatively rural area in Pine City, Minnesota. On April 7th, 1989, 22-month-old Aaron asked his mom, can I go out to the backyard to play? She was making dinner in the kitchen, which would have had a good look through the window to the backyard. So she said, yeah. Aaron went out there with their beloved dog. They were inseparable. The mom looks out the window repeatedly and she sees Aaron with the dog. Then at one point she looks up and she sees Aaron playing next to the snowmobile. Then at about 4.30 p.m. she looks up again. This time, Aaron is gone. She runs out to the backyard, panicked, looking for Aaron and the dog. The dog comes running up, but Aaron is nowhere to be found. At 5.10 p.m. she contacts police and within minutes there is a whole slew of police officers there. The house they lived in bordered the Snake River, and this was maybe 150 to 200 feet away from where Aaron was last seen playing. And so the sheriff and the sheriff's deputies immediately begin to search the river, thinking Aaron must have fallen in. They spend a very long time searching the river. They do also bring in dogs to pick up Aaron's scent, including dogs who are, I guess are specialized to sniff through icy cold water. But they don't really get any hits. They do have people out there and they're searching top to bottom and they cannot find him. Now at one point they actually take a dummy the size of Aaron and they throw it into the river just to see where it would end up. And the few times that they did this they were always able to find the dummy because it always had gotten caught up on something. And the fact that they couldn't find Aaron in that same way or any trace of him was a little concerning. Meaning he may not have gone into the river at all. So at one point, a volunteer private investigator gets involved because they're trying, he's trying to sift through like misinformation because some people are saying foul play had to have been involved and some people are saying foul play was definitely not involved, that this was an accidental drowning, even though Aaron hadn't been found. And ultimately through the, his investigation when talking to sheriff's people, talking to the parents, to neighbors, and they also talked to all of the dog handlers who were brought in to pick up Aaron's scent because apparently the dogs picked up scent that would go, I guess, out to a road in the front of the house and then it went up to an adjoining property and then down this dirt road. So the, this a private investigator determined that this was likely a child abduction case that Aaron was taken. That's not stopping them, however, from putting out flyers. They are still searching the neighborhood. They're searching by helicopter, but they're not having any luck. At one point, Aaron's dad uh, basically insinuates that he believes that a neighbor kidnapped his son. There was a neighborhood couple who were in their 60s and they lived um, with their daughter. And he says he believes that they were responsible for whatever happened to Aaron. However, he has not elaborated on what he means or why he thinks that. I guess at one point, all he really said was that there was just bad blood between them, that the neighbors didn't like them. But I guess police looked into this and they determined that they were not involved, that these neighbors didn't do anything to Aaron, that the chief investigator in this case believes that they had nothing to do with it and that he's even said that there was no foul play involved. The police did admit they spent most of their time with the theory that he fell into the river and didn't really investigate many other angles. So there could have been better time spent kind of branching out on different angles, but they were running with, uh, he fell in the river, we'll find him eventually. They haven't. The parents, by the way, were never considered suspects in this. I know that's a lot of people will ask, like, oh, did they talk to the parents? They were so unbelievably cooperative and they were just fighting the authorities to, to really say that this wasn't, he didn't go in the river. We're, we think foul play was involved. They were putting a lot of attention on this. And so there has never really been a belief that either of them was involved in this. I do know that they eventually would um, have three more kids, but they did get divorced down the road. But they still joined forces in trying to find Aaron and whatever may have happened to him. Despite searches, despite looking in the river, despite everything, Aaron has never been located. 
There have been reported sightings of him from time to time. They've never been substantiated. They've never been corroborated. At one point, there was someone who believed he may be Aaron. They did get that person's DNA and confirmed it was not Aaron. If Aaron was abducted, it was done so quietly. Uh, like I said, his mom did have a pretty good view of the backyard, but he could have wandered off in a matter of seconds, maybe been lured away um, out of her view, and it would have only taken a few moments. But she didn't hear like any screaming or crying or anything. Given how thoroughly they searched that river and the tests they did with the dummies, they should have been able to find him in that river if he went into it. It doesn't mean he didn't and they just, just so happened not to find him this time, but odds are they would have probably found him. But they also don't have conclusive evidence that he was taken. They don't have conclusive evidence of foul play. But something happened to 22-month-old Aaron that day. And to this day, it remains a mystery. There may be a chance that someone somewhere out there knows the truth about what happened to Aaron Anderson. Perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information, please call 763-494-6100. You can also call 1-800-THE-LOST. If you know anything that can help bring Aaron home, please call. Hello, True Crimeers. This is another missing or murdered Indigenous woman case. And this is the case of Ada Elaine Brown. Viewer discretion is advised. Ada Elaine Brown was the youngest of eight siblings, and they were a part of the Tall Ten First Nation. And this case occurred in the Prince George area of British Columbia. Ada's siblings would describe her as the prettiest and the funniest of all of them. She was the life of the family. She was like the heart. But when she was younger, she definitely had some struggles, but she would always reach out to her family when she needed them. At the time this case occurred, she was 41 years old and she was the mother to two children. On April 9th, 2001, in a motel room in Prince George, the deceased body of the 41-year-old was found. The police and the coroner, before the autopsy had really even begun, had basically just declared that Ada died of natural causes without doing any investigation and without really starting the autopsy. The family wouldn't find out for a full year afterwards, which is when they were finally able to obtain the uh, autopsy report, that she died from a subdural hemorrhage. And then her death at that point was listed as undetermined. When her family went to lay her to rest, they noticed that they could barely even recognize her. Ada had been beaten. She had two black eyes. She had bruises on her body. It was more than evident that someone had beat her. And so how they can even start by saying natural causes is completely unbelievable. And then to turn around and say, uh, it's undetermined. What it sounds like is they didn't really want to bother doing any kind of investigation because, well, she's indigenous, so. According to her family, in the days leading up to her death, Ada had gone to the doctor on two occasions complaining of severe headaches. However, they would find out that the doctors really didn't treat her for anything and they just gave her Tylenol and sent her home. After her death, the doctor would reveal that Ada had complained that she had been assaulted a few days prior by a female. And also the doctor listed something that says the unsubstantiated history of an assault five days prior to her death. And yet they did no investigation into this. They didn't track down who this woman was, didn't even try. Her family believes that a man did this to her, though, and that this was a man that Ada knew. This man had been abusive towards Ada before. Who that man is and his connection to her, though, I'm not 100% sure. He was described as a really shady guy. He dealt in drugs. And it got to a point where Ada would tell some of her family members, if I end up dying, it's him. But as is the case with so many indigenous cases here in the States and in Canada, it's no one can be bothered to actually look into this. It's too much work, I guess. The police in Canada, they failed Ada. They failed Ada's family. They just dismissed her case like that. The family doesn't even know if anyone was even questioned in this. I don't know a lot of the circumstances, like where she was living and where her kids were at the time. I do know that her family did take on the responsibility of raising her kids though, after her passing. Ada was a fun, outgoing person. The life of the party, the life of her family. Somebody did this to her. But some people don't really want to bother looking into it. And Ada is not alone. As I said, Ada is one of many. I have covered many of these cases before. And it seems that no matter how much you tell these stories and how often you try to scream about them, the people that need to listen 
won't listen. But Ada and her family deserve answers. They deserve peace. They deserve justice. If you have any information that could help them actually open this case and treat it like a homicide, please contact the authorities in Prince George, British Columbia. And hopefully they will do the right thing. If you know anything, please come forward. Robert Stack, what are you doing holding that sawed-off shotgun, bud? You silly goose. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of this psycho, Albert Leon Fletcher. Viewer discretion is advised. January 11th, 1995, Dade City, Florida. 24-year-old Albert Fletcher managed to escape from a prison van because he somehow managed to pick the lock of his handcuffs and his ankle restraints. The guard shot at him but missed, and Albert continued to run down this river, and he vanished. What led to this? Albert Fletcher's weapon of choice was this sawed-off shotgun. Could you imagine seeing Robert Stack just float on down a hallway with, because he's dead, and he'd be a ghost? But with this shotgun, it'd be terrifying. What? Albert Fletcher was a career criminal. He was an absolute piece of shit. Armed robbery, armed burglary, grand theft, aggravated assault, aggravated battery, and also murder, which is why he was in that prison van to begin with. A lot of the times he had the help of his cousin here, Douglas Porter. On April Fool's Day, April 1st, 1993, the two of them would go on a 24-hour crime spree. First, they broke into a home in Dade City, Florida, where they stole several things, including a sawed-off shotgun. Next, they go to the parking lot of a local grocery store, where they see this man here named David and David's girlfriend. Albert and Douglas begin to harass the couple. For no reason. They didn't know who they were. David gets out of the car and begins to yell back at Albert and Douglas. When Albert tells him to get his ass back in his car. Albert and Douglas took off. David, he was pissed, so he took off after him. A little chase ensued where David tries to pull Albert into his car. But Albert points the sawed-off shotgun into David's face and he grabs the barrel and he begins to move it. But the two of them manage to get away and David is left unharmed. That happened around 10 p.m. An hour later, at approximately 11 p.m., a 16-year-old pizza store employee left his job and got into his car. His car wasn't starting. Suddenly, a man, later identified as Albert, comes up to the window, points the shotgun at him, and says, get out of the car. The 16-year-old kid cooperates and runs back into the pizza place. Albert tries to start the car to steal it, but he can't start it. So he says, fuck it. He gets out of the car, jumps back into the car that Douglas was driving, and the two of them take off. Then they get onto the highway where they begin to tailgate a random person on the road, later identified as Nelson Medina. He had a wife and two children. They get up next to him and they demand that he pulls over, but he does not want to do that. And so they point the gun at him and they essentially try to run him off the road. Nelson finally stops and he's at the side of the road where Albert goes up to his window and demands his wallet. Nelson says no. Albert lifts his shotgun and just shoots Nelson directly into his chest, killing Nelson Medina instantly. A couple of hours later, their little crying spree just continues, but they are eventually pulled over. The officer who pulled him over had the two gentlemen step out of the car. When he looks inside the car, he sees the sawed-off shotgun with blood on it, knowing at that point that a man had just been shot, likely with a shotgun not too far away. So the two of them were arrested. Witnesses would come forward to state that these were the two men who had accosted them throughout the evening the pizza employee, the gentleman named David, and a few other people who saw them wreaking havoc. The blood on the shotgun would later match that of Nelson Medina, so they knew they had the right people who committed this murder. Douglas Porter was charged with connection to the murder, plus also robbery. He would be convicted, and he was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole. He was given the option for parole because he was not the one to physically kill Nelson. But he also did nothing to stop it, and he did nothing to turn himself in or Albert. He was eventually paroled out. Then in January of 1995, Albert Fletcher is being transported. He is still awaiting his trial, and he escapes. His case gets featured on Unsolved Mysteries and also on America's Most Wanted. A woman in Delaware thought she recognized one of her newer neighbors as Albert Fletcher, but she wasn't positive. But a couple of weeks later, she finally goes to the authorities. So police in Florida get in touch with police in Delaware because they have to organize this as discreetly as possible. And they confirm that the man that this woman called in about was Albert Fletcher. And he was arrested without incident. He'd been living under the name Kevin Woodside with a woman who had absolutely no idea about his evil side. 
he would tell people that at this point he was glad it was all over and he was glad he was caught because he was tired of the life he was living. In July of 1996, he was convicted for the escape charges and was sentenced to three years for that. Then he went on trial for the murder where he was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison without parole plus an additional 35 years. Sucks to suck. It has now been 14 years since she was found, but they still have no idea who did it. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Amber Jackson. Viewer discretion is advised. Amber Jackson was actually originally from Riverside, California, but at the time of this case, she was living in Hawaii. Specifically, she was living in Kauai, which is also known as the Garden Isle. She had been living here for roughly nine or ten years or so when this case occurred. Amber was described as free-spirited. She was kind, she was caring, she was sweet. She was easy to talk to and easy to make friends with. Amber, pictured here with one of her lifelong friends, she actually was working as a secretary for the Teachers Association there in Hawaii. Amber, who loved going out with friends and family, also renovated houses. It was something she excelled at. And she had her own lettuce farm. Now, Amber was last seen and heard from on June 23rd, 2010. Amber was supposed to go out to dinner with a friend and her friend's husband, but she didn't show up to it. The following morning, she did not show up to her job at the Teachers Association, which was very much unlike her, because if she was not going to be there, she would let them know. The friends she was supposed to meet for dinner the, the previous night and her co-workers, they all immediately felt something was wrong. This was not... Amber. So her friends go to her house and they knock on her door and see if she's there. She doesn't answer. Her car is in the driveway. In her car is her purse. But Amber is nowhere to be found. Until nine days later. A man was uh, hunting with his hunting dogs. And that is when the dogs came across a decomposing human body. Where the body was found was apparently in an area that was really inaccessible to people. It was really hard to get to. And it was clear that this body had just been thrown over and dumped into this area. And it would take rescuers some time to get to the body. And soon after arriving at the coroner's office, they were able to identify the body as 57-year-old Amber Jackson. This was not an accident. She did not fall. She had severe blunt force trauma to the back of her head. And it was very evident to the coroner that this was done by an instrument. And there were other indications on her body that she had gone through a pretty extreme assault, an, an attack. It was brutal. They believe that the instrument used was likely something like a, like a metal pipe or something very similar to it, a very linear object. Now, there was no indication that she had been sexually assaulted. There was no evidence of that. There was also very little forensic evidence to pull from her remains. So police there in Kauai, were, they're having a hard time right from the get-go. Now, allegedly, there are at least two suspects in her case. Now, one of them was a tenant of Amber's. This tenant was living on uh, a yurt, which belonged to her. And apparently the two of them were somewhat kind of dating. And she would tell people that this guy was operating a marijuana farm. And he had actually spent time in federal prison before for about six or seven years. And she told her friends that this guy could sometimes have a temper. Police interviewed this man and apparently he said that the night she was supposed to go to dinner, he had tried to, or he said he asked her to have sex with him. And he says that she said no, and then he just left. And that was the last time he saw her. The other suspect uh, in her murder was, I guess, a neighbor. A neighbor who knew the first suspect and did dealings with him. And I guess people in the neighborhood would say that this particular neighbor probably had some explaining to do um, with regards to, I'm guessing, her murder. Now, this guy was apparently missing the night that she would have probably been murdered. He was gone all night long. And he would later explain to his wife, because he was married, that he said he had backed into somebody's boat and so he was hiding from them. Okay. There were also reports that there was a pair of women's sandals in his truck that did not belong to his wife. They would not have fit her. However, years and years has gone by. It's now been 14 years. Neither man has ever been charged or arrested or anything. And that's mainly because there is zero physical evidence to connect either one of them to her murder. Physical evidence is obviously something you need. Or some damning testimony from a witness. But nobody has come forward to state that 
either man has admitted to killing her or anything along those lines. And you can't just arrest someone because, ugh, they're suspicious. Well, you're not supposed to, at least. There is currently a $20,000 reward for any information that can help lead to the arrest of Amber's killer. It needs to be a valid lead and a valid tip. And if money is what you need to influence you to do the right thing here, then, then there it is. You got it. Somebody somewhere out there knows the truth about what happened to Amber Jackson, and perhaps that someone is you. Perhaps the killer talked to you. Maybe you're afraid. Well, you can report your information anonymously. If you have any information about her case, please call either one of these numbers you see here on the screen. Please help Amber and her family and her friends, her colleagues, get the justice that she rightfully deserves. They would give her the nickname Annie Doe, which would end up being an unbelievable coincidence. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Annie Doe. Viewer discretion is advised. This case began on August 19th, 1971, along the Redwood Highway near Marker 35. A man and his son were driving along this highway and decided to pull off to the side to sleep. Early the next morning, they walk into the woods and they stumble across a skeleton. And it was the skeletal remains of a human. So they contacted the police. The individual was wearing all of these articles of clothing. And then here's just more. And they were able to determine that this was the body of a young female. They believed that she was somewhere between the ages of 14 and 25. But because of the state of her remains, because it was just, you know, skeletal remains, they actually do not know how she died. However, they do consider this to be a homicide just based on the situation where she was found, you know, that kind of thing. So they would end up doing a clay remodeling of what the woman may have looked like. And this is that image. And then they also came up with this drawing, hopeful that it would lead to someone recognizing her. They ended up giving her the name Jane Annie Doe, which is unusual. They don't usually give middle names. But the person who did the rendering said she just looks like someone named Annie. But the image, like I said, did not get any leads. There was a time that someone considered her a potential victim of the Zodiac Killer, but it didn't really make much sense considering it was outside of his normal area. The woman had a map in her one of her pockets, and they believed that she had been traveling possibly with some sort of sightseeing tour, or she was on her own solo tour, or maybe she was with someone and that person killed her. But for the longest time, her identity would remain unsolved. They would put out a more uh, computerized image of what she may have looked like. And eventually they ended up doing the genetic genealogy tests with the Ancestry.com websites, that stuff like that. And they were finally able to find out who she was. She was 16-year-old Annie Lehman. Her actual name was Annie, which is just such an insane coincidence that they nicknamed her Annie. And that was her actual name. Annie was originally from Aberdeen, Washington. However, there, it's kind of hard to see if there's any reports about if she was reported missing or not. She was last seen by her family in 1971. And the circumstances of how she ended up, where she ended up, still also unknown and unclear. There is some belief that maybe she ran away from home. And there is some belief that it's possible she was a victim of human trafficking. But that has not been corroborated at all. As a matter of fact, it's just a mystery of how she ended up where she ended up. It's a mystery how she died. And it's a mystery who put her there. But somebody did. Somebody killed her. They have no doubt that this was a murder. So somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth. I mean, I know this happened back in 1971. I mean, it's been like 50-ish years. So if this was a full-grown adult who did this to her, that person might still be alive, but also might be dead. If it was a younger person, definitely they could still be alive. It really just depends. But maybe that person told you something and you've carried that with you for decades. It's time to come forward now. It's time for Annie Lehman to get justice. Her family finally got her back home to bury her and lay her to rest properly. But now there is still that one remaining mystery. Who done it? If you have any information about this case, please call 541-474-5123. Two, three. Justice for Dennis Wusenhoff is a TikTok page that I would like for you all to follow. Dennis Wusenhoff was a detective in New York who was killed in a car bomb just outside of his home. His murder has remained unsolved. 
and the Justice for Dennis Wustanov page is run by his children. Now, I have made a video on his case, but I am not going to tag my video below. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to tag their most recent video. I'm also going to just tag their page as well. That way, we can increase their follower count, which will hopefully put more views onto their videos. Because the more eyes and ears that see and hear about this case can only increase the chances of the family finally getting justice. So please go to their page, give their videos a like. Do not spam like them because that actually ends up hurting accounts. Leave comments, repost their videos, share their videos, and hopefully we can do something to get justice for Dennis Wusenhoff and his family. So this is something I would like to do from this point moving forward. I'm going to eventually pin this video at the top of my profile. And if there are any TikTok pages that are strictly dedicated to finding justice for a murdered loved one or a missing loved one, please tag that TikTok page in the comments below. And I will make a video just like this one to get traffic over to those pages. So if there are any out there, please tag them below. It may take me a while to get to a lot of these, but I will get to them. So let's boost these pages and hopefully we can get them justice and we can get them answers. Hello, true crime earners. This is the case of the Bay County Jane Doe. Viewer discretion is advised. It was May 30th, 1996 in the Warren Bayou near Southport, Florida, that the body of a woman was found. Her body was in a pretty severe state of decomposition, so identifying her based on visuals was going to be impossible but they do know that she was murdered. The woman's remains had no identification and they had absolutely no clue who she was. This is a recreation of her image that they came up with, but to this very day, her identity has never been discovered. The coroner determined that she had been killed probably about six weeks prior to her being found. Now, based on the likeness that they put out there, there would be witnesses who stated that they saw this person, this woman, at a place called Tan Fanny's. It was a topless bar in the Panama City, Florida area. She was last seen leaving this bar on April 20th, 1996, and this was with a man later identified as Billy Frank Hansen, whose photo I cannot find. I've even tried looking up, you know, jail records, prison records, but I can't find it. So that man, Billy Frank Hansen, has since basically admitted to killing her. Billy Hansen would say that he was out with a friend going bar hopping that night, and they found themselves at Tan Fanny's. Billy Hansen and his friend would leave the bar sometime around 3.30, and this victim, who, again, they don't know who she was, asked for a ride home, and Billy and his friend said yes. Now, the woman was so highly intoxicated that Billy Hansen would admit to police that they passed right by her house, or where she said she lived, the area, but she was so intoxicated that she didn't even realize it, so they kept driving. And he did that on purpose. According to Billy Hansen, the victim said that she would have consensual sex with him. But then apparently, according to him, she changed her mind and said, I'll do it if you pay me. And apparently that's what set this whole thing off. He took her to the steam plant canal area and on a dirt road, he would take her out of the vehicle where he raped her and then he killed her. Then he dumped her body in some reeds in the bayou. The man would be convicted of her murder, of second degree murder. I'm not sure what happened to the friend. And he was sentenced to 21 years in prison. However, the woman, still unidentified. Police do have two complete fingerprints from her remains, and I'm sure they have taken DNA from her remains. But so far, as of, you know, today in 2024, her identity has still never come to light. But somebody has to recognize her. I don't know how accurate of, you know, uh, an image of this is of her, though. That's the problem with recreations is that sometimes, especially way back in the 80s and the 90s, they didn't always look so good. So this may be a general likeness of her, but it may also have a lot of differences with what she actually looked like. But somebody out there has got to recognize her. I mean, this was a human being. She was a person. She might have been someone's sister. She was someone's daughter, someone's granddaughter. She could have been someone's mother, somebody's aunt. She was someone. 
And it's unbelievable that nobody has identified her. It makes you wonder, like, was she living uh, kind of the life of a recluse? Maybe she wasn't close with her family or friends. But even still, you'd think they would say, oh my god, that's my so-and-so. The victim had shoulder-length, light brown, wavy hair with blonde highlights. She had previously suffered fractured ribs, both left and right. Also a broken nose and a leg and knee injury. All of those had healed. They were not from the attack uh, with her murder. It's believed that those injuries might have happened from an automobile accident. Her fifth metacarpal on her left hand had a boxer's fracture. There is also some belief that she may not have been an American citizen and that she may have come from somewhere in Europe. Police also discovered that she had apparently tried to call a friend that night, but police have not been able to track down who that friend was. Now, the house or the location where she told the guys to drop her off at, I don't know what's going on with that. Like if they knew her exact address or if she only gave them a general area, or maybe they were just boldface lying and she didn't say any of that. She didn't say, take me home or give her, give them her address. You know, I don't know 100%. There's really very little published about her case. If you have any information on the identity of the Bay County Jane Doe, please call 850-747-4700. And no, I don't know if they've done the genealogical or forensic, you know, genealogy yet. I'm not 100% sure. But if you recognize her, please come forward. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Bianca Piper. Viewer discretion is advised. This case occurred in the area of Foley, Missouri, and it happened back in 2005. Bianca Piper was born on December 26, 1991, and at the time of this case, she was 13 years old. She was an 8th grader at Winfield Middle School. Bianca also had ADHD and was diagnosed as bipolar, and so she was in therapy. So Bianca at times, you know, had some anger issues, and at one point her therapist would tell her mom of, I guess, a good practice to do, that if she ever had some kind of, you know, anger or meltdown, to take Bianca and drive her a little ways down the road from your home, drop her off, drive home and let her walk home, walk off the this, you know, round of anger. And apparently it worked in the past. On March 10th, 2005, Bianca had uh, a bout of anger. And so her mom took her about a mile away from the home at Bianca's request and she dropped her off. And Bianca just had a flashlight on her. Bianca never made it home. Nobody has seen her since. By 8.20 p.m. that night, Bianca was reported missing and a citywide search began, but no trace of Bianca has ever been found. Initially, they believed that she must have just gotten lost because she was a pretty good distance away from home. And so they searched every possible way that she may have gotten lost, but found no sign of her. Bianca had never run away from home before. It was just one of those things that she never did. And they didn't really believe that that's what happened here. The belief, it sounds like even from investigators and from everyone else, is that she was abducted. Someone took her that night. I do know that her mom was uh, polygraphed, as did uh, her mom's boyfriend. Both passed with flying colors. Her biological dad was also interviewed and questioned and polygraphed. He passed everything. And none of them have really ever been considered a suspect. In 2007, this man here, Michael J. Dublin, was being investigated by a task force. I have talked about him before many years ago. Uh, he had abducted two teenagers. Both were teenage boys and both were found alive. However, no evidence was ever found that linked him to the disappearance of Bianca. And unfortunately, that is where this all ends. There was a slight update in 2023 when there were human remains found in a septic tank near where she was last seen. And I do know that they worked with forensic genealogy, but it doesn't sound like they have results yet or they weren't linked to Bianca. If alive today, she would be about 33 years old, but there haven't even been sightings of her. But at the same time, you can never give up hope. Somebody somewhere out there might know the truth about what happened to Bianca Piper that day. If that someone is you, please call 636-462-6513. He brutally murdered five people in one night, and basically, he got away with it. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Bradford Bishop. Viewer discretion is advised. It was March 2nd, 1976, and this is a recreation. A forest ranger in North Carolina near... He came across a small fire. He managed to put the fire out, and when the smoke finally settled, he was absolutely horrified at what he saw. 
there was a shallow grave, and inside that grave were five bodies. And next to them was a shovel and a gasoline can. The bodies were charred, and so it was impossible to know who they were. Meanwhile, back in Bethesda, Maryland, a neighbor to the Bishop family called the police to report them missing. She hadn't seen them for a week. This was extremely unusual because if a family ever planned to go out of town, they would always contact this neighbor. Hey, can you come and water the plants, pick up our newspapers, etc. And so she became worried when none of that happened. The detective gets to the house and he notices a drop of blood on the ground outside the front door. He's able to gain entrance to the home where he sees more blood. Blood spatter, this is recreation by the way, TikTok, not real, but blood spatter all over the walls, all over the beds. It was a nightmare, but there was no one actually in the house, not a single person. Where was the Bishop family? The Bishops consisted of Bradford, his wife, Annette, Bradford's mother, Lobelia, and Bradford's three sons. William, Brenton, and Jeffrey. Six people missing. And even though back at this time, communication between police departments wasn't exactly uh, instant, it became instant news that there were five bodies found in a shallow grave in North Carolina, and now there's six people missing from a home in Bethesda, Maryland. So they were able to connect these two stories. And using dental records, they were able to confirm that the five bodies in the grave was Annette, William, Brenton, Jeffrey, and Lobelia. Bradford, nowhere to be found. Where was he? Well, Bradford worked for the State Department. He had been doing that work for quite some time. He kept anticipating a promotion, but a promotion never came. And he was obviously upset about this. He voiced his opinions on it. And colleagues of his can also recall that he constantly complained about him having fights with his wife at home all the time, that their relationship wasn't very strong. According to Brad, he said that his wife, Annette, and his mom, Lobelia, constantly harped on him for basically treading water um, at his job, that he was washed up because he couldn't get a promotion. He wasn't advancing, he wasn't going anywhere. Can anyone confirm they actually said those things? No, because they're now dead. So really, it's just the word of Brad. On March 1st, 1976, Bradford would leave his job at the State Department, and it was apparently his last day there. He told the secretary, I'm leaving early because I'm going to go see a doctor. Well, he never went to the doctor. Records would end up showing that he actually went to a hardware store where he purchased a shovel, a pitchfork, a ball-peen hammer. He then went to a gas station where the, he filled up a gas can. Then he went to a bank where he withdrew several hundred dollars from his account. They believe that Bradford got back to his home in Bethesda sometime between 7.30 and 8 p.m., and that is when he committed the murders. They believe he killed Annette first, then he killed his three sons, the oldest being 14, and then he also had a 10-year-old and a 5-year-old. He killed all three of them with the hammer, and then he killed his mother. All of them were struck over the head repeatedly with this ball-peen hammer. He then loaded all of their bodies into their station wagon, drove them down to Columbia, North Carolina, where he dug a shallow grave, put their bodies inside, dumped gasoline over them, and lit them on fire. Several days later, his station wagon is found in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park parking lot. The vehicle is abandoned and it's locked. The person who sees the car notices there's blood in the back. And in the license plate, they would look it up and confirm that this was the car of Bradford Bishop, but he was nowhere to be found. They also found the murder weapon inside the vehicle, the bloodied ball-peen hammer. At this point, they knew Brad was the one who killed his entire family. Why he killed his family is actually still unknown. Some say he just snapped at the pressure of not getting a promotion and his wife and his mother allegedly nagging him. Some say this was a meticulously planned event. I mean, he did leave work early, went to a hardware store, purchased the murder weapon and a shovel to dig the grave. He purchased gasoline to light their bodies on fire. He took out a whole bunch of cash. So this was obviously premeditated. But why is still the question. And that's because Bradford Bishop, to this very day, has never been found. There have been sightings of him all over the world. Unbelievably, one of his previous colleagues at the State Department, well, Roy, was in Italy. This was in 1978. In an absolutely insane twist, while in Italy, he sees Bradford Bishop there, years after the murders, while he's on the run. Bradford is completely um, disheveled, he has a full beard, but he knows it's him. 
And Roy kind of calmly walks up to him and says, hey, Brad, let's go to the Italian authorities and let's turn yourself in. Bradford immediately responds by screaming and running. And he's never found, never caught. Bradford was indicted on five counts of murder in absentia. Which basically means he was indicted without actually being present where he hasn't been found or located. In 1992, when they're kind of doing a, a, a look into this case, they actually uncover a letter where Bradford Bishop had actually tried to hire somebody to kill his family prior to him doing it. He tried to get a convicted bank robber to do it, but it never happened. And so Bradford took it into his own hands to do it himself, which again shows that this was premeditated, that this wasn't just a random snap. But again, what was the actual motive? Why did he want his family dead? It's unknown. The most confirmed recent sighting of him was in 1994 in Switzerland, but no reported sightings of him since. In 2014, uh, authorities in Alabama were alerted that a man who was killed in a car accident back in 1981 had a strong resemblance to Bradford Bishop. So they got a court order to exhume this body and they took DNA and it was not him, which makes sense because Bradford had been seen um, in 1994 and this guy died in 1981. But sightings could always be wrong. And kind of a side note here, this woman here, Kathy Gilchrist, well, after she retired, she wanted to find out who her birth parents were because she was adopted. So she puts her DNA onto one of those ancestry type websites and unbelievably she finds out that her father, her birth father, was Bradford Bishop. She was born before any of his other five children were born. And that would have been during a time when he was studying at Yale. She never met him. She never knew he existed. And the scenario in which, like, who hit the, the mom was, that's still kind of a mystery. In the 90s, the FBI would put out this computerized digital recreation of what he may look like as an older man. And this is the most recent computerized image of what he may look like. But today, it's 2024. Bradford Bishop would be somewhere around 88 to 89 years old. There is a very solid chance that at this point he is probably dead, but he could still be alive. And while he may not see a prison cell for very long, if he is alive, there is still a chance that justice can be served. There's no statute of limitations on murder. So if he's out there somewhere still, he absolutely deserves to face justice. If you have any information on where his whereabouts might be, maybe you know who he was, but now he's dead. You can direct the FBI to where to exhume a body to confirm it's him. Any information you have, contact your local FBI office. Because if anything, if there is an answer to this mystery as to where he ended up, well, the family, the remaining family members, they deserve to know. They deserve the truth. So please, if you have any information, please call. Where is Bradley Straysoner is a TikTok page I would love for you all to follow. I have not covered Bradley Straysoner's case yet, but his name is on my list. This TikTok page is run by Bradley's ex-wife, and it's dedicated to finding out where Bradley is, because police, from what it sounds like, are not being very helpful. Bradley was last seen in October of 2019. On October 31st, 2019, his vehicle was found abandoned, and it was about two miles away from where he was last seen. The car was unlocked, the keys were in the car, there was no signs of foul play. They have conducted searches for him, and this is mainly searches conducted by friends and family, with the help of a nonprofit organization called the Community United Effort. But still, they have not found him. No traces of him. I will cover his case at some point. I pick my cases at random. But in the meantime, please go follow her page. It's all linked below, including one of her recent videos. Like the videos, but don't spam like them because that hurts. So let's try to help them out. This is another worst deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. So this particular story involves a pair of train hoppers. This is not an actual photo of them. But by December of 2011, there was a 25-year-old young man and his 22-year-old girlfriend. They decided they wanted to do some like old style, you know, 1930s train hopping adventure across the country. Now, at one point in Florida, they found themselves on a train carrying coal. These coal trains don't have any like roofs on top, so it's easy for them to just lie on top of them. So once the train got to the power plant where this particular incident happened, they would dump the coal. And I'm gonna show you what I think is a similar process. I'm not sure if it's, this is the exact process they used at this location, but I think it's something similar.
That's it. So what happens is there are doors that open on the bottom of the train and it just dumps all of the coal. And in this particular situation, there were uh, trucks, I guess, where the coal would fall into. And the trucks were several stories below. Later on, when they were unloading the coal from the truck, they found two bodies buried underneath this massive amount of coal. It was the young couple who had been train hopping. The young woman had several blunt force trauma injuries to her body, in particular to the center portions of her body, which the coroner attributed to the several stories fall onto this pile of coal. And then coal was dumped back on top of them. The gentleman, uh, he died of asphyxiation, meaning he landed in this pile of coal in the truck and was then crushed by the coal falling on top. And it was so much coal that obviously they weren't gonna be able to move from it and so he slowly suffocated. They, the only thing they don't know is if the couple was on the very top of the pile of coal, like in the train and it just dumped with them on top of it, or if they were in maybe an empty train cart that just, you know, the, the door opened, they fell into the truck and then the coal dumped on top of them. They don't 100% know. But regardless, it had to be a completely jarring moment for this couple who was suddenly just dumped from this train without, you know, warning. They obviously did not know that this was the process. But one moment you're just sitting there on top of this pile of coal, and the next moment you are free falling several stories with all of this coal, and then you land and then you get buried. I mean, that's a, that's a freaking nightmare. Doesn't sound like she suffered too much, but sadly it does sound like he did. And he was buried alive. And this is a, a cautionary tale of the dangers of doing this sort of thing. You could have freak accidents like this, you can get robbed. It is a very dangerous thing to do. So it is definitely not recommended that you do this type of thing. It took 62 years to solve the brutal murder of a young girl. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Candy Rogers. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Candace Rogers, who would go by Candy, was in the fourth grade. She was just nine years old and she lived with her family in Spokane, Washington. Candy was a member of the Bluebirds, which was a part of the Campfire Girls of America. She was really, really excited to be in that group. And she was super excited to start selling the Campfire Girl mints. And that's exactly what she was doing on March 6, 1959. Candy had about seven boxes of mints to sell. And she was just going to be going around her direct neighborhood, which was located on Mission Avenue. And she should have been back at her house within a few hours. But that came and went, and she never came home. And very shortly after that time frame, her family would report her missing. And it began an instant, uh, humongous search. The biggest search that Spokane had seen ever. During the search in a wooded area, they found a box of Campfire Girl mints, this exact box here, and they were by the Fort George Wright Bridge. They just assumed they were candies, but she was nowhere around it. She was nowhere to be found. As they're searching, police do talk to some witnesses who think they saw a man who looks something like this around the neighborhood when Candy was walking around it. So they created this image of that man. They don't know if he was the guy or not, but they began to circulate his image. But they didn't really get any tips from it. From one potential tragedy came another. During the search, the uh, U.S. Air Force was involved. The main Corps Reserve Unit, they had the Boy Scouts of America, they had the U.S. Postal Service, they had every branch they could think of helping search. This included having helicopters in the air. One of them being a Sikorsky H-19 Chickasaw helicopter. Well, as it was searching at night, uh, it accidentally ran into a power line, which caused the helicopter to crash. There were five Air Force men aboard the helicopter. Three of them tragically lost their lives. About two weeks after her disappearance, um, some hunters found a pair of shoes in the woods, which then led them to a pile of twigs and sticks, brush, and underneath it was a body. It was the body of nine-year-old Candy Rogers. Candy had been strangled to death and she was sexually assaulted as well. But unfortunately, with this being 1959, DNA technology didn't even exist. Crime scenes weren't uh, contained the same way we have them now. Evidence wasn't collected the same way we do now. But they did collect evidence and they stored it. But unfortunately, for the longest time, her case goes unsolved. 
detective after detective, cold case unit after cold case unit begins to look in this case, but it just keeps getting them nowhere. And then finally, in the early 2000s, they now have DNA technology, which is greatly advanced. They decided to take all of the evidence from this case, including the clothing Candy was found in. And they were actually able to pull a male profile off of her clothing. And this was believed to be a semen stain. Now, at one point, there was a suspect named Hugh Morse. And in the early 2000s, once they had this DNA profile, they compared it against his, and it was not a match. But that guy had committed two more murders between 1959 and 1960. So he was already in prison for life, but he was not her killer. Then in 2021, the DNA technology has once again advanced more. They used Othram Labs. Then they were able to create a genetic profile, which then they would use the genetic genealogy, ancestry.com places, and they found a family, and it narrowed down to three brothers within that family. One of those three brothers had died in 1970, but he had a wife and a daughter. So they asked the daughter if she would be willing to provide her DNA to see if they could help solve this case, and she agreed. And they found a linkage between the daughter's DNA and the DNA found with Candy Rogers. So that gave them now the ability to get a warrant to exhume his body, which they did. They got his DNA directly from his remains, and they confirmed that this man here, John Hoff, was Candy's killer. I believe he lived in that general area around the time, but he never came up as a suspect. They don't know how, if he knew Candy Rogers, or if this was just he was driving around the neighborhood and just snatch the first child he saw. They don't know the circumstances of how he got her into wherever he took her. And obviously they'll never know because he's dead. He actually ended his own life in 1970. Could be from the guilt that was weighing on him for what he did, maybe. So she'll never see real justice in terms of him going to prison, but at least his life was a living hell and he took the coward's way out in the end instead of having to face justice. So in a way, Candy Rogers got a different kind of justice, and it was the justice she rightfully deserved. It happened 62 years ago, and they still do not have the answers. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Carol Ann Doherty. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Carol Ann Doherty was just nine years old. Her and her family lived in Bristol Borough in Pennsylvania. At the time, a very quiet, unassuming, family-friendly place. It was October 22nd, 1962. Carol had some books that she wanted to return to the local library. So Carol got onto her bike and she began her journey. It was a short little trip, one she had done many times before. Now on her path to the library was this church here, St. Mark's Roman Catholic Church. Her family was religious and she went to Sunday school and she was taught that if she passed by a church, she had to go in and say a prayer. And so it's believed that that is what she did. This was in the early to mid afternoon. By 4.30 p.m., Carol never made it home. Her parents became very worried, so they began to search for her. Their search took them to the church and just outside of it, they saw Carol Ann's bike. It was just leaning up against a wall. And then they entered the church just up a flight of stairs on a landing that led to a loft there inside the church, they found Carol Ann. She was deceased. Carol had been strangled to death and she was sexually assaulted. They believe based on witness accounts that she was likely killed sometime after, just shortly after 3.30 p.m. Clutched in Carol's hand was hair, later determined to be pubic hair. This would have been the hair of her attacker. But in 1962, they did not have the technology, obviously, that we have now. But those hairs were collected and stored properly. From the get-go, they did have a couple of suspects. One was a man named William Schrader, who was, from what it sounds like, a, like a transient in that area. He was sort of known in the community. But he was observed being just outside the church shortly after the murder would have happened. The other potential suspect they had was actually a priest at that church, Father Joseph Sabatish. Sabatish gave police an alibi, which they would later find out was actually a lie. Thou shalt not lie, Father, right? Witnesses actually placed him also just outside the church around the time the murder happened. 
but there was not sufficient evidence to arrest anyone or charge anyone. And unfortunately, Carol's murder goes cold. At some point in the 90s, they do take those pubic hairs that were found with Carol and they try to do some DNA testing on it, but it's done unsuccessfully. They then try again, I think like a few years later, and again, they're not successful. By 2024, now this year, they have said that the DNA of from those pubic hairs are, it's pretty deteriorated at this point. But they are hopeful that they can somehow still build a DNA profile because nowadays they can take even the tiniest like sample and creates a full profile. So they are still currently, I think, working on that DNA sample to see if they can then, you know, do the whole forensic genealogy and, you know, the whole thing. Their two prime suspects to this day are still Joseph Sabatish and William Schrader. William Schrader had actually committed a murder in the 70s and an arson and he went to prison for it. He also had accusations against him after the murder of Carol Dougherty uh, with regards to molesting young girls. And later on, when a grand jury wanted to interview him, he pled the fifth on every question. William Schrader is now dead. Father Joseph Sabatish died in 1999. Sometime around 2018, 2019 or so, the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office was doing an overarching like investigation with regards to sexual abuse of children by clergy in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. That would have included um, Joseph Sabatish. There were accusers that came forward who pointed blame directly at Sabatish, as in like they were victims of him. Um, but unfortunately, he'll never have to face justice for whatever he may have potentially done, because like I said, he's dead. But that does give some potential insight into him as a person and what he may have been capable of doing. So all I know is that right now the DNA is still being tested. And as of me filming this video in October of 2024, results have not been announced. And that's one of those things that may take quite some time. These things usually take like months and months. And with it being 62 years ago, you know, even if her attacker wasn't those two men, maybe the attacker was a teenager or possibly early 20s, the guy is still going to be in his 80s. More than likely, her attacker, her killer is dead. The two prime suspects are dead. So there may never be proper justice for Carol Ann Doherty, but there could still be answers a family could still get some kind of potential closure or something close to it. So hopefully one day very soon, the answer is about who did this thing to Carol Ann Doherty will one day finally be revealed. Was she the only victim or was she a part of something much larger? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Cheryl Ann Kenny. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Cheryl Ann Kenny was 30 years old. She had a husband and two children that she absolutely adored. Her and her family lived in the Nevada, Missouri area. It was a pretty rural area. She was a fantastic mother. She was a beloved wife. She was a hard worker and an absolute joy to be around. Pictured here was the Quality Convenience Store, which was in Vernon County in Nevada, Missouri. This is where Cheryl worked, and she was working there on the night of February 27th, 1991. By all accounts, everything seemed to be going fine according to customers who had come in and out of the store. She was in good spirits. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. She was her normal, happy, friendly self. Witnesses would see her cleaning shelves, tidying up things, the normal stuff. Now, from that point on, it's really just speculation. So the store was scheduled to be closed at midnight, but the manager would give the clerks discretion to close the store early if it was a slow night. And from what it sounds like, it was a slow night there. So Cheryl decided she was going to close the store a little after 10 p.m. At some point that night, there was another person, another worker in the building, a gentleman who I guess took care of the maintenance for the lights there, but he left before Cheryl did. He did indicate later to police that he did see one or two male customers walk in that he did not recognize and neither did Cheryl, which was kind of unusual because this was such a rural part of town that they knew everybody who came in. But Cheryl was then left alone and she closed up the store and set the alarm at 10.17 p.m. She would walk out of the east entrance to the store and she would go to her car in this area, which this is the type of car she drove. But Cheryl never made it home. Cheryl would be reported missing sometime shortly after this. Her car, when they went to the convenience store, was still in the parking lot. The car was unlocked and these were manual locks, so she had to open them up with her keys. 
but there was no signs of a struggle near the car whatsoever. It would first be her husband that went to the convenience store. He was the one who actually found the car first. And then the convenience store was locked up. The lights were turned off so that he knew that she had left the building and locked the door. So what happened between then and when she got to her car to unlock it? That's the mystery. There was no sign of a struggle in the store. There's no blood. There is no like ripped out hair. There's no broken windows, no drag marks in the dirt, nothing. Cheryl was there and then she was gone. Witnesses would later state uh, that they were working at a local 3M plant, which was a little down the road, and they heard the sound of a woman screaming sometime around that 10.15 to 10.30 time frame. So what they can conclude is that Cheryl did her duties at the store, she locked up, set the alarm, walked out to her car, attempted to get inside of it, and then was accosted at her car. And that someone likely kidnapped her from there. And that's it. She's just vanished. Somebody took her, is what they believe. Even though there's no signs of foul play, it is believed that she was kidnapped. And she wasn't the only one. 42-year-old Trudy Darby was kidnapped from a convenience store also in Missouri in January of 1991. Her body was later found, and it was obvious that she had been murdered and sexually assaulted. I have covered Trudy's case before. Another case I covered also in 1991 in Missouri was the mysterious disappearance of Angela Hammond. She was talking on a payphone to her boyfriend when she was kidnapped while on the phone with her boyfriend. Then there is the mysterious disappearance of the Springfield Three in Springfield, Missouri. I've covered all of these cases before. You have at least six women who were kidnapped in Missouri between 1991 and 1992. There is speculation, and the police you know, believed, at least back then, that all of these cases possibly were connected. But one of these cases would eventually be solved. Trudy Darby's murder. Her killers would confess to their friends. The friends would then go to police. Trudy was murdered by Jesse Rush and Marvin Cheney. At one point, police did say they suspect that these two men are involved in Angela Hammond's and Cheryl Kenny's cases, but not the Springfield Three. However, they have never been charged or indicted or anything in connection with those disappearances. And I don't see any updates on whether or not they are still considered suspects. But it is pretty similar, especially with Cheryl Kenny. Trudy Darby was in the exact same situation, convenience store, kidnapped. It would fit the bill. Kenneth McDuff is a suspected serial killer who had killed some people in the area where all of these disappearances occurred, and he was considered a suspect at one point. However, they have no physical evidence and no links whatsoever to actually suggest that he had anything to do with any of the disappearances. It's really just speculation and theory. Cheryl Kenny has still never been found. Her children have grown up without their mother. Her husband had to move on without his wife. Her family has to live with the fact that she is still out there somewhere, probably buried alone in some shallow grave, and all they want is for her to come home. They want to put her to rest. Somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth, and perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information about the disappearance and possible murder of Cheryl Kenny, please contact the authorities at 417-283-4444. Zero, zero. The FBI has been looking for him since 1983. Hello, True Crimeers. This is the case of Colleen Rastich. Viewer discretion is advised. So this case occurred in the Joliet, Illinois area, and unfortunately, I have very limited information and almost no photos. Colleen Rastich was born on May 10th, 1960, and that's really all the information I have on her. At some point, she meets a man named Raymond Scoville. They become romantically involved, and then she ends up basically becoming his business partner. Raymond owns like a record store called Third Ring Records, and Colleen started working there for him as like a cashier, but then she would become a part owner of the business. But at some point, Colleen discovered that he was not making payments on, on loans. And he also, she found out, wasn't paying his income taxes. So she uncovers that Raymond may have actually been embezzling money. And so she attempts at that point to not only stop being with him romantically, but she also is trying to stop the business due to the unethical things its owner is doing. They end up filing uh, lawsuits against one another. On August 3rd, 1982, Raymond asks Colleen, will you come over to my place? And she says yes. And nobody sees Colleen alive ever again. 
Four days later, Colleen's body is found in the trunk of a vehicle that was abandoned at a parking lot. And that was in Chicago, Illinois. She had been shot eight times. Within a week, Raymond Scoville is arrested and charged with her murder because everyone knew that he was the last person to see her. He ends up telling the police that he killed her. He confessed. He wrote out a confession for him. But he says he did it in self-defense. It's not common that you see a person be shot eight times in self-defense. I mean, usually one or two shots can at least incapacitate the person so that they're not allegedly attacking you anymore. But to shoot them five, six, seven more times? Mm. He was definitely very much against her because basically she was ruining his life. Even though he was the one who actually r ruined his own life, he probably blamed her for it. He is released on a $50,000 bond, and as his trial is going on, he is still allowed to leave and go home. On April 13th, 1983, he does not show up back to court in the middle of his trial, and he has never been seen since. But the trial continued on as they were looking for him, and he would be convicted of Colleen's murder in absentia, and he was sentenced to about 42 years in prison, despite them not knowing where he even is. Raymond Scoville is also wanted for the murders of two of his other girlfriends. However, they don't have any evidence to actually show that he was the one to kill them. And they can't question him on him because, well, he's gone. And as of me filming this in November of 2024, Raymond Scoville is still wanted by the FBI. But there have been no sightings of him. Very few tips, almost no leads. He has just vanished into thin air. Raymond Scoville would be 73 years old today in 2024. At the time of his disappearance, he was six foot tall, weighed about 160 pounds. He had red hair at the time of his disappearance, and he has brown eyes. I don't have any age progression photos of what he may look like today, unfortunately, but this is the best I got. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Raymond Scoville, please contact your local FBI office as soon as possible. He is a convicted murderer. He has potentially killed two other women. He is a dangerous person. You can report information anonymously. You never have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. So please help. If you know where he is, please call because Colleen is still waiting for her justice to be served. He made a careless mistake by spitting, and now he's in prison forever. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Corey Parker. Viewer discretion is advised. Corey Parker was born on August 15th, 1973, and she was born in Rochester, New York. But when this case occurs, she's actually living in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. At the time, she was 25 years old, and she was a waitress at the Ragtime Tavern, which was on Atlantic Beach. She had moved to Florida uh, specifically to attend college. Corey did have a boyfriend at the time, but she'd only been dating him for about three weeks. So when it came time to Thanksgiving, her boyfriend would travel out of state to his family, and she decided to stay home in Florida. The last time anyone can recall seeing her was the night before Thanksgiving, and this was in 1998. She was expected to show up to work the day after Thanksgiving, but she was a no-show, which was extremely unusual for her. So a co-worker of hers would go to her apartment building and knock on her door, but Corey didn't answer. So the employee called the work and the, the manager there said, hey, can you maybe look in a window, see if you can see her? And so the co-worker looks into a window and he is shocked because he sees what looks like Corey's foot and it's covered in blood. So he immediately contacts police. Police arrive to the apartment building and they gain entry. And once they gain entry, they find Corey. She had been murdered and very, very brutally. She was found in her bedroom. There was blood just everywhere. One of the detectives said there was so much blood on her that it looked like somebody painted her body with blood. There was no forced entry into her apartment. There was also no sign of any kind of struggle anywhere else in the apartment other than her bedroom. They did notice that there was a window in the kitchen which was unlocked. And when they looked at the window sill, they found blood. It looked as if someone had bloody hands and put their hands on the ledge to climb out. And there was also a small spot of blood on the outside of the sill. The blood after testing did not belong to Corey. Corey had been posed in a very sexual manner. However, the coroner would state that there was no actual evidence that she was sexually assaulted. Corey had been stabbed an absolutely staggering 101 times. A little more than half of those stab wounds were after she was dead. But for nearly half of them, she was alive. 
Corey had defensive wounds on her knee. It looked like she lifted her knee to block a stab wound. She also had a deep cut on her hand. It looked as if she had grabbed the blade as the killer was stabbing her. But in the end, she unfortunately did not win out. Her ultimate cause of death were um, very deep cuts and slashes to her throat. They believe the murder happened the night before Thanksgiving because when her friends saw her the night before Thanksgiving, she was wearing a certain outfit and they found that outfit uh, folded up on her bed right next to where her body was found. There was also a Zippo lighter found on the ground, which none of her friends or family could say belonged to her. She did smoke, but they never saw her using a Zippo lighter. They also found a couple strands of hair that did not belong to Corey, and at least one of them had a, a root at the end, which means they could build a DNA profile from it. They just needed someone to match it to. They did investigate uh, two of Corey's co-workers, one of them male, one of them female. The female, I guess, was pretty obsessed with Corey, it seemed like. And she even would place herself at the crime scene the night it would have happened. She said she had gone there and knocked on the door, but Corey didn't answer, and so she left. Ultimately, both co-workers were eventually ruled out because none of their DNA matched the DNA at the crime scene. Her boyfriend was ruled out. He was confirmed out of state when this happened. And so the case kind of sits at a standstill for about 18 months until this man comes into play. This is a man named Robert Denny. A friend and co-worker of his would come forward to police because Robert's behavior around the time this murder happened was very kind of crazy. He was very sketchy. He was always pacing. He always seemed nervous. He stopped showing up to his work after the murder happened. And then one day he just picks up and randomly and suddenly moves out of state. Well, he was questioned during the initial investigation. Why? He lived in the apartment building. This is a view from his apartment. That is Corey's apartment. He had a perfect view to see her, but he told police back then that he didn't even really know her. He never talked to her and he denied having anything to do with it. And they had no evidence to say that he did. Well, Corey had told this friend and coworker that he used to live next to a girl that he really wanted to date. And the friend didn't piece together until about 18 months later that he was talking about Corey. So with all of this, police wanted to see if his DNA matched the DNA found at the scene. He was not going to give it up willingly. So they had to do a stakeout. They followed him around everywhere. He knew they were onto him. He was a smoker and every time he smoked, he would take a cigarette, put it into a plastic bag and brought it home. His boss would tell police that Robert was always very paranoid about anything he touched. He always collected everything he drank from, every cigarette he smoked. When police talked to him and they offered him water, he refused it. He didn't want to touch anything. By the way, a uh, girlfriend of his or an ex-girlfriend saw a photo of the Zippo lighter found in, in Corey's apartment. The ex-girlfriend said, that looks identical to one that Robert used. She could not say for sure it was his, absolutely, but nobody in Corey's life ever saw her use it. And then one person said, that looks like one that Robert uses. But at any rate, one day he makes a giant mistake. He spits onto the ground a few times. This is during a stakeout, they have binoculars on him. They watch him go back inside and they collect his spit. They run it against the DNA found at the crime scene, the hair and the blood found on the windowsill. It was a match. He continued to deny it, but he was eventually arrested. They took DNA directly from him just to confirm, and again, it was a match. So he's charged with her murder. It's actually kind of frightening what they believe happened. They think that he was obsessed with her. He knew she was out of her apartment, and so he snuck in through the kitchen window, and he hid in a closet waiting for her to come home. And when Corey was most vulnerable, he pounced. I can't even imagine how terrifying that had to have been just to see a man come running out of your closet. He goes on trial. His defense team tries to state that the crime scene was contaminated. There was no really evidence of that. That some of the DNA didn't match him, but some of the DNA did. And it was DNA that was like hair in her bloody hand that should never have been there if he wasn't the killer. But it was his DNA. But there were other hairs, I guess, found that did not match him. But the evidence still pointed to him being the one to do it. A jury found him guilty and sentenced him to life in prison without parole. A guy who was trying to be so careful made one stupid mistake. And thank goodness he did. Because Corey and her family got the justice that she rightfully deserved. Missing Child Danielle Bell is a TikTok page I would love for you guys to follow. Danielle Bell was a 14-year-old girl who was last seen on September 30th, 2001, leaving a party. She has not been seen since. 
Now, I have not covered Danielle's case yet, but I have added her name to my list so that I will be covering her case um, at some point. But I have been reading about her case for the past hour or two, and the TikTok page here was recommended to me by another creator. So I'm not sure when I'll have a video on Danielle's case out because I do pick my cases at random. So in the meantime, I would love it if you guys follow this page because this is Danielle's sister um, who has been fighting to get justice for her sister. It does sound like there is uh, a belief that she may have been murdered the night she disappeared. And it does sound like they do have kind of a general idea of who have may have done something to her. And so what you can do right now to help is to go to this TikTok page, uh, give it a follow. I will tag the page here in the description. I will also tag um, their most uh, recent video. So please give their videos a like, but like I always say, do not spam like their videos because that actually ends up hurting the page. Watch the videos all the way through. Just leave a comment. Typically, I know they say five words or more for a comment. Share the videos, repost the videos by hitting the little button down here and then clicking the little yellow repost button. Because even though we are all in different parts of the country, and different parts of the world, we can collectively help by putting more eyes on this particular page and this case, which may prompt a response. You never know. Why not give it a try? Why not make an effort, right? So pretty please give this page a follow and show them some love. Thank you. A house on fire and a missing man. Where is Daniel? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Daniel Moses. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Daniel Moses was 59 years old and he was living in the Rich Square, North Carolina area. Daniel was known in the area as the barbecue man. He did like this kind of side business where he would deliver barbecue chicken to people around the area. And they said he made some of the absolute best. He was a really good cook. Daniel stands at six foot three and he also has a black belt in karate. His family called him just larger than life always in like a state of happiness and joy, and he cared deeply for his family. But then one day, he vanished, and nobody knows why or where he is. It was June 16th, 2011. 911 receives a call that a house is on fire. When they arrive, they find the home completely on fire, and once they put all the fire out, the house is halfway destroyed. This was the home of Daniel Moses. When they go inside to search, he isn't in it, and neither is his dog. The fire wasn't going long enough, and it certainly wasn't burning hot enough to have completely destroyed his or the dog's bodies. If they were in there, they would have been found. To make matters even more confusing, his truck was still parked outside. His barbecue pit, which was next to his vehicle, had all of its tools laid out, as if someone was getting ready to barbecue something. But again, Daniel is gone. A few years goes by, police are nowhere even close to finding out what happened to him. Daniel's sister would actually get a tip from someone who stated that around the time that Daniel would have likely gone missing, she was driving down this road when the car in front of her hit a bump and the trunk of that car opened up. And the woman who was telling the story said she saw what looked like a the leg of a black individual in the back of this trunk, motionless. She saw that his foot had a tennis shoe on and was wearing a tube sock, but they didn't know the license plate number and th that lead really ended up going nowhere. Another individual would tell his sister that this individual said she knew who killed Daniel. And no one really was knowing if he was dead or alive or not, but she, this witness said that Daniel and this person, this killer, got into a fight. Well, Daniel's sister found out the person's name and that person would take a polygraph test and apparently that suspect passed the polygraph, which of course does not necessarily mean anything. A couple of years ago, they got a tip that Daniel may have been buried kind of uh, right outside of this abandoned prison. So they searched on foot, they brought in cadaver dogs and a whole bunch of volunteers, but it ended up leading them nowhere. They never found any remains. According to Daniel's sister and the FBI, Daniel is one of seven black individuals who had gone missing from that general area in a you know certain time frame. And really they're just wondering who's trying to find them. Is anybody really trying to find them? It doesn't sound like a whole ton of effort is being put into it. it sounds like Daniel's sister is doing a lot of the work herself. Nobody has seen Daniel ever since. There's really no sightings of him. All of his belongings, his truck, everything left behind. 
but they don't really know if this is a foul play situation or if he made himself disappear. But for what reason, his family doesn't know. Somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth about what happened to Daniel Moses back in 2011. And perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Daniel Moses or what may have happened to him, please call 252-534-2611 or you can call 800-334-3000. Did a ghost contact a detective from beyond the grave? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of David Chase. Viewer discretion is advised. This case occurred in 1995 in the town of Evergreen, Colorado. David Chase was a local craftsman and cabinet maker, and he was married, and this is his wife, Judy. Now, the two of them could not have their own children, but they were at that time uh, planning to adopt two foster children that were already in their care. Both of them were really, really excited about this. David was so excited and looking forward to raising these two kids. But unfortunately, before any of that could happen, tragedy occurred. Oh, Jesus. On June 6, 1995, David was scheduled to do some work with this man here, Matt Orahosky. They were going to be doing some work on a roof, and also they were going to be cleaning some debris and clutter from the local elk lodge. After this, according to Matt, the two of them went into town. They went to a restaurant, had some lunch, had a drink. Then, according to Matt, they went to a bank where David withdrew about $1,800 in cash. Then they went back into town and went to another bar and had a couple of pints of beer. But David never comes home that night. And that concerns Judy a lot because that was very much unlike him. The next morning, Judy reaches out to Matt and says, Hey, what happened to David? Where is he? Well, Matt tells her that he left him at the bar, and then that's the last time he saw him. But then, oddly, later on that day, Matt's girlfriend calls Judy basically in secret and says, uh, Matt told me a different story about what happened. Matt told the girlfriend that David had gone to the river, um, set up a raft, and went down the river, which Judy thought was extremely strange, because why wouldn't Matt just tell her that? So Judy goes to police to report Matt missing. He might have gotten hurt or in an accident somewhere. And so at that point, the police reach out to Matt Orohosky. He tells them the same story he told his girlfriend, except he changes it a little bit. He tells police that he did not get into a raft and go down the river. He says that the two of them disposed of some of this brush they had cleared into this river. And then suddenly David just decided to jump in the river. And then Matt says he didn't see him after that. So I, I'm, did he just leave him there? It's very confusing. Well, six weeks goes by and David Chase is finally found. He is found floating in the river. He was about three miles downstream from where Matt says they last were, where he last saw him. What's interesting is that the toxicology report showed that he had no alcohol in him. He wasn't drunk at least. His blood alcohol level was below the limit, which didn't make sense because Matt said that the two of them had drank like three or four different pitchers of beer that day, but his cause of death was drowning. However, David was basically he had no clothes on. He had his socks and shoes on and he had cuts along his legs. It seemed like someone had actually deliberately cut his clothes off like his pants. And that's why he had those cuts on his legs. The autopsy also showed that his neck had been broken. So police go back to Matt Orhoski and says, hey, you want to change your story? And he gives them the same story, except he changes it kind of again. This time he says that David didn't jump into the river. He said that David fell into the river. And despite there being a fire department within 100 yards of where this happened, and plenty of people nearby, not to mention he himself, he didn't call for help. He didn't go anywhere. He didn't even help him. And what's more, Judy would find out from Matt's girlfriend that Matt, that she found $800 in cash in Matt's truck money that he did that was not his money and then the case takes a bizarre twist this is a detective named phil harris on october 15th 1995 he was asleep in his study when all of a sudden the distant sounds of a man talking woke him up it was a disembodied voice in the room with him somewhere saying to him quote my name is david chase i was murdered i want you to investigate my murder go buy the sunday paper end quote he gets the paper, he finds an article about the death of David Chase. He would go to Judy and say, listen, for a fee of $1, I will take this case and I will solve it. He would then say that over the next couple of weeks, he began to hear David Chase's voice constantly, giving him information that he should not have known. He would tell you know, Judy about pet names that David and Judy had for one another that were private. 
He would just tell her details about the scenario, the case, things that nobody else should have known, and he knew them. Well, the voice told him that Matt told David to take that $1,800 in cash and put it into his pocket, and that David could take that $1,800 in cash and buy a truck from Matt that he was selling. But then the voice says that David changed his mind, that he didn't want to buy the truck, and that pissed off Matt because Matt felt he was promised that money to sell the truck to David, which then led to an argument which caused Matt to beat David, ending up breaking his neck. Phil was also told by this voice that there was a second person involved who helped hide or dispose of David's body into the river, and it did in fact cut his clothes off with a knife, which is what left those knife wounds on his legs. Sadly, less than a year after Phil became involved in this case, he died. He passed away suddenly from a heart attack, and unfortunately he never got to the conclusion he promised Judy he would get to. Matt Orohosky is considered a suspect in this case, but he has never been arrested. He's never been charged. A detective named Don Olin, who took over the case, said that he definitely believes that David was murdered, there's no doubt about it, and that Matt Orohosky was his killer. And he wanted to press charges, but the DA said, we're going to keep working on this. And the DA has never, even to this very day, ever pressed charges against him. And David's killer, if it was Matt, has never been found. At some point down the road, Judy would say that there is a possibility that the adoption and foster situation may have actually led to David's murder. She says that the that investigator, Phil, along with other private investigators, determined that that was a likely motive in this case. The two children after David's death were taken away from the house, and Judy had claimed that there was a possibility that child trafficking was involved in this whole scenario somehow. But none of that has ever been corroborated at all. But that also doesn't have any ties to Matt Orohosky, who seems to be the actual perpetrator here. He was the last person to see David alive. But somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth, and perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information about his murder, please call 303-271-0211. Breaking news in the Delphi murders case, there is finally a verdict. Richard Allen has been found guilty on four counts for the 2017 murders of two teenage girls from Indiana, 14-year-old Liberty German and 13-year-old Abigail Williams. This is one of the most infamous true crime cases in recent years, and it really centered around the Snapchat video footage that one of the victims took of their killer. He was referred to as the bridge guy. He was also called the down the hill killer because they released audio of the man talking to the girls, and you can hear him saying, girls, down the hill. A lot of information is still kind of under wraps. There's actually still a legal gag order over this case, even with there being a verdict. This was one of those cases that a lot of people thought may never be solved. And then all of a sudden, Richard Allen was arrested in 2022, I believe, for the girls' murders. But they have kept the case pretty hushed in terms of what evidence they had. What I do know is that Richard Allen kidnapped the two girls that afternoon, and at some point he cut their throats. They also had a bullet or a shell casing near right next to one of their bodies that they would link to a gun owned by Richard Allen. One of the biggest reasons why his arrest came so suddenly, kind of like out of nowhere, was because he actually went to police shortly after the murders happened and told them, I was there in that area during that time frame. But there was a document, I guess, about this that said he was cleared, when in fact he wasn't. And this legal snafu was caught by a clerk who made it, you know, known to the authorities, and they brought him back in, and they started to investigate him, and it all kind of just went downward for him. He was officially arrested on Halloween 2022. Richard Allen apparently has denied having anything to do with it, despite the fact that he himself had confessed to a few people. His motive, I'm not 100% sure if they established that or not, or if that's part of the gag order. To my understanding, the girls were not sexually assaulted, but in one of his confessions in jail, he said that was actually his plan, was to rape them. But then something happened where he ended up killing them both. But that's a rumor, I'm not sure if that's actually what it is. I believe his sentencing is scheduled for December of 2024. So as of right now, I'm filming this on November 11th, 2024. I do not know what his sentence is at this time. 
But thankfully, this was a case that didn't seem like it was going to go anywhere, where all of a sudden, all of this just happened, and it happened very abruptly and very quickly. And so finally, Liberty and Abigail and their families, their friends, they all finally got the justice they rightfully deserved. He calmly walked the halls, shooting co-worker after co-worker. And this event would coin the term, going postal. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Edmond Post Office shooting. Viewer discretion is advised. The case occurred in Edmond, Oklahoma in 1986. Here in the Edmond Post Office. It was August 20th, 1986. Disgruntled postal worker Patrick Sherrill would walk into the post office, and with him he had his mailbags. But what people did not know was that those mailbags contained guns. Patrick walked into the building, and he locked the door behind him. This happened just after 7 o'clock in the morning. He calmly took out one of his guns and just began shooting. There were over a hundred different postal workers inside the building at that time, and immediate panic kicked in the second he began to shoot. But he just, according to witnesses, just casually and calmly walked the halls, calmly raising his gun and just shooting people, and then shooting towards people who were trying to flee. Within seconds, the police are called and they arrive on scene. Postal workers are running out of the building because they found ways to get out and escape. It is complete and utter chaos. And Patrick just keeps shooting. In the end, he murdered 14 of his co-workers and injured an additional six. And he had one more victim, himself. He was not going to be arrested. He was not going to face the consequences for what he did. So when he knew the jig was up, he put the gun to his head and pulled the trigger, ending his own life in the process. 15 minutes, 14 innocent people murdered. Six more people nearly lost their lives. Why did this happen? What, what made him do this? Patrick Sherrill was basically a disgruntled postal worker. He had been reprimanded several times in recent months for poor performance. It's believed that Patrick felt he was on the verge of being fired. And well, he couldn't handle that embarrassment. So he decided to take matters into his own hands. The first person he shot was a man named Richard Esser Jr. That just so happens to be the supervisor who reprimanded him the day before. It seemed as if he sought that man out specifically, and he was looking for another supervisor named Bill Bland. But Bill Bland slept in that day, and he wasn't in the building. He was a pissed off postal worker who was getting in trouble for a shitty performance. And so this is where the term going postal originated from. An actual postal worker who shot and killed 14 people injuring six more. So now whenever you hear the term, someone is going postal, this is where it all began. This is the memorial that was constructed on the site. The building is still up. Unfortunately, I do not have photos of the victims, not all of them. So to be fair, I'm just going to give you their names. Patricia Ann Chambers, Judy Stevens Denny, Richard Esser Jr., Patricia Gabbard, Jonna Ruth Gragert, Patty Jean Husband, Betty Ann Jared, William Miller, Kenneth Morey, Leroy Oren Phillips, Jerry Ralph Pyle, Paul Michael Rockney, Thomas Wade Shader Jr., and Patty Lou Welch. Fathers, mothers, uncles, aunts, sisters, brothers, all of their lives were cut short because one man was just really bad at his job and didn't want to get fired for it. So he took 14 innocent people with him, and then he just took the coward's way out. He did not want to have to take accountability for his actions. And I hope hell is real, and I hope he is rotting. Hello, True Crimeers. This is the case of Elizabeth Salgado. Viewer discretion is advised. Elizabeth Salgado was originally from Mexico. At the time of this case, she was 26 years old. And a month prior to this case, she had moved to the Provo, Utah area and moved into these apartments. Now, she had moved to the States, to Utah, because she had gotten a scholarship to go to the Nomen Global Language Center. And it was there that she was going to be learning English. And I think she got the scholarship after she served uh, like a mission for the Mormon Church, which was in Mexico. Elizabeth was incredibly excited for her new life in the United States. She was an incredibly intelligent young woman and she was picking up the language very fast. But unfortunately, Somebody did not want her to continue living. Elizabeth Salgado was last seen on April 16th, 2015. 
and she was last seen by fellow students outside of the school. Her apartment was about 18 blocks away, and by all accounts, that's where she was heading after that day of school. But nobody knows if she ever actually got there. And nobody ever saw Elizabeth alive again. When her family learned that she hadn't been in contact with anyone for quite some time, they would report her missing. And I believe some of them would come to the States to look for her. So once the police got involved, they checked her cell phone records, they checked her bank records, and nothing was done on any of them. Meaning there was no activity on her cell phone, no activity on in her bank account since the day she was last seen. Her family and a lot of other people believe that Elizabeth was taken by force. But where that happened, whether it was from her own apartment or on her way there or somewhere else is unknown. Elizabeth didn't really know many people there in Utah. So it's not like she had a boyfriend or anything like that. And so if someone did something to her, it was likely a stranger or maybe it was someone from her school. I don't know if police have looked into anyone she went to school with or not, or if they have, how thoroughly have they checked into them? I don't know. But her case pretty much goes cold. That is until May 18th, 2018, sometime around nine o'clock in the morning. Police are notified of something that has been found um, near the Hobble Creek Canyon. A driver was just on the road up on the hill and he pulled over to use the restroom. When he looked down, he saw from a distance what he thought was maybe a skull. And it was not a place that he could reach easily, so he contacted police. And after some time, they were able to traverse and get down to the bottom of this canyon. And it was in a, a very wooded kind of area, very secluded, that they found the skull the guy had seen, along with other human remains. Using dental records, they were able to confirm that the skeletal remains that were located were that of 26-year-old Elizabeth Salgado. Her cause of death has not, it's either not been revealed or they weren't able to determine it. However, the police in Provo, Utah are stating that this is a homicide investigation. Where she was found was not off a trail. It was not off a beaten path. It was in a place that nobody should ever be in. So it's as if someone had to have just dumped her and maybe rolled her down a hill where she ended up in some brushy area. This is a heartbreaking uh, moment when her family traveled from Mexico and they are now in the exact spot where Elizabeth was found. And, you know, they put a little cross there for her and they put her photos and memorial was built there for her. But what they don't have is the answers on who did this. Elizabeth was in this canyon for three years alone. Three years worth of weather, torrential downpours, heat. It all destroyed any potential evidence destroyed possibly figuring out exactly how she died. To my knowledge, they don't really have any forensic evidence other than her remains. I was reading that I guess they did have a couple of suspects, but their names have not been released publicly. And they also have never been charged or indicted or anything with her murder. And at this point in November of 2024, from what I can see, there are no suspects in her murder. They don't know if she was kidnapped and held captive for a long period of time and then killed, or if she was killed that day. But somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth, has got to have something, some tiny piece of information that police can use to figure this out. And maybe that someone is you. You can report your information anonymously. You do not have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. Elizabeth's family deserves that. Elizabeth deserves that. She deserves justice. So if you have any information about the murder of Elizabeth Salgado, please call 801-851-4010. Justice for Eric Nellums is a TikTok page I would like for you all to follow. Now, I covered the Eric Nellums case, I believe, over on my backup page some time ago. But I'm not going to tag my video. Instead, I'm going to tag one of the more recent videos from the Justice for Eric Nellum's TikTok page. I am also going to tag the actual account in this, all of that in the description below. So please go to this page, like their videos. Do not spam like it because spam liking ends up hurting the account. Watch their videos to the end. Leave comments, hit the repost button, share to other people here on TikTok or on Facebook, Instagram, etc. Eric Nellums was killed in September of 2003. He was shot in his own front yard when he was just on his way to work. And this all happened in Phoenix City, Alabama. Eric Nellums was a husband and a father. As a matter of fact, his family was just inside the house when he was gunned down. And now the family, it's more than 20 years later, is still seeking justice for Eric. There's no way it should have taken this long. 
But the more eyes on this TikTok page, the more ears that are listening to the story, the better it will be for them in terms of maybe getting justice sometime sooner rather than later. The entire goal of me making videos like this from now on is to bring attention to these TikTok pages so that we can help them in any way we can. Because as we all know, the more eyes on a story means the more tips they might get, which could lead to the actual answers. Is it a guarantee? No. But doing something is better than doing nothing. So please go follow the Justice for Eric Nellum's TikTok page. Again, the links will be in the description right here below. If you have any other TikTok pages that you are aware about that are dedicated to true crime cases, especially unsolved ones or missing persons cases, please tag them either in this video or I'll have a video pinned to the top of my profile where you can also leave comments like that. That way I can find those pages and I can make the same type of video for them. So let's help get eyes and ears on these stories. This is a stand-up ride? No, thank you. Nope, I'll pass. Nope, you can't make me do it. Sorry, baby, you do it. I'm on the ride. This is great. Great. Wonderful. You are going up slowly and painfully waiting my eventual demise. That is where this is waiting. Oh, look at how high we are. This is great. Here we go. Okay. He's off. He's off. He's off. Oh, it's too fast. Can't do it. Mm -mm. No. Oh, we're going upside down into loopy loops. There goes cookies. Do not care for that. Ugh. Anyway, now it's a good time as ever to get some reading done. Will you shut up? I'm trying to find out what's on TV tonight. God, who's the boss? Oh, cool. Uh, can't wait. Hello, true crimeers. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. This particular story takes us to King's Dominion, which is located in Doswell, Virginia. It's a 280-acre sized park with 48 attractions, and at one point, one of those rides was called the Shockwave. It is one of those insane standy-up roller coasters, meaning you're standing up on it. You got a harness over you. Well, on August 23rd, 1999, tragedy befell one thrill seeker on this ride. At the time of the incident, the coaster was going roughly 40 miles per hour, and it was going towards its final turn. Well, for whatever reason, this particular ride goer decided to remove his restraints, and at 40 miles an hour, he was launched from the train, and he smacked his head into one of these steel beams as part of the track. He slammed into this, like, walkway. And then he fell to the ground below. I don't think it was very high up at that point. I don't know if he was killed instantly, but he was pronounced dead shortly after the incident happened. Numerous eyewitness accounts would report that they saw this man trying to free himself from the restraints. Nobody knows why or what he was doing that for. Two weeks later, another incident happened on the same ride, this time to a 13-year-old boy. He became concerned that his safety restraints were not fastened properly. And so he intentionally slipped out of his restraints as it was going up the large, you know, first hill. And he managed to jump onto the catwalk. He was injured, but he actually survived. Now, the first incident, they did have a safety team investigate everything. The restraints were in working condition. There was nothing faulty with them. This death was caused by an individual who, for whatever reason, removed his restraints. It does beg the question, though, as to why is it easy to do that while the ride is on in motion. In August of 2015, the Shockwave roller coaster was dismantled for a new ride to take its place. When you're on these types of things, folks, don't remove your restraints because it could lead to something extremely horrific. A gruesome discovery would lead to the question, who were the remains in Gabby's trunk? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case known as Gabby's Bones. Viewer discretion is advised. It was a cold March 30th, 1992 here in Thermopolis, Wyoming. A man named Newell Sessions decided, you know what? It's finally time we open up that mysterious trunk. This is the exact trunk in question. The original owner of the shed where this trunk was located was a man only referred to at the time as Gabby. However, in 1986, he would move away from Thermopolis, but he left his shed and all the belongings inside of it back in Wyoming. So he asked his friend, Newell Sessions, if he would move the entire shed off of the property, which Newell agreed to do. 
A couple of years goes by, Gabby comes back to Wyoming to remove some of the belongings from the shed, but he still leaves behind the trunk. A couple more years goes by, Gabby still hasn't claimed that trunk, which is padlocked. So Newell Sessions, along with some friends, said, you know what? I'm done being curious about what's in this trunk. I'm going to open it. And this is a recreation. He took a blowtorch and he knocked the lock off the trunk. When they opened it, they found this thin sheet of like plastic or paper. When they moved that, they found human remains. This is a recreation, not the actual thing. This was the full human body of someone. Now, Newell Sessions admits that at that point, he was basically saying, you know what, let's just bury this trunk and bury this body properly, not even knowing who it was. But his wife was like, are you freaking kidding me? Uh, there is a skeleton in a trunk, a locked trunk. You're going to tell police. And so he agrees to contact the local sheriff. But first, he decides to contact Gabby and say, hey, what was the deal with that trunk? Gabby tells him, I purchased that trunk a long time ago at like a garage sale, yard sale, something, I can't remember. And he said when he bought it, it was padlocked. Gabby told uh, Newell that over the years he planned to try to open the trunk, but he never did. He never just got the tool to do it. Now, if you buy a mysterious trunk from a yard sale or a garage sale, you're probably going to want to see what's inside. But when Newell told Gabby what was in the trunk, you know, human remains, Gabby was completely shocked. He was surprised. And it felt genuine to Newell. But at that point, Newell gives the remains over to the police. When they do an x-ray, they find something more alarming. There is a bullet lodged in the skull. It was behind his left eye and it came from a downward angle. Later, they determined that the bullet came from a 25 caliber Colt semi-automatic pistol with a 2-inch barrel. This is a bullet and a gun would have been produced sometime in the early 1900s. They believe that based on the angle and where the bullet was located in the skull, that it came from a right-handed person who shot this individual at close range, likely while standing over the person. The trunk itself was manufactured in the early 1900s, and there was a plastic bag inside that came from a grocery chain that stopped producing those bags in the 50s or the 60s. So they determined that this individual was killed sometime between the 1940s and 1960s. Well, Gabby says he would have been far too young to have committed that murder, and he has no idea why the bones are in that trunk. And they had no evidence to really arrest him or anything. So eventually they do this clay recreation of the individual's face. They guessed on the hair, but they said that this is likely what the man looked like. But unfortunately, the case of his identity and how he ended up in that trunk remained unsolved for a very, very long time. Eventually, the family of a man named Joseph Mulvaney would come forward to say that they think, based on this image, that that might be their family member who's been missing. And so they took some DNA from the family members and compared it to DNA from the remains. And they confirmed who this person was. It was Joseph Mulvaney. Joseph Mulvaney disappeared off the face of the earth sometime around 1963. He was born in January of 1921. He joined the Illinois National Guard in 1941. Eventually, he would move to California where he became a railroad worker. And then he married a woman named Mary Alice and they had several children together. So the composite was, I think, pretty similar to what his face looked like. I think maybe the hair kind of threw people off. But other than that, it's, it's pretty damn similar. So... When he disappeared, nobody reported him missing. The kids, his children, were led to believe that he voluntarily left, so no one thought anything of it. Here's an interesting little tidbit. Joseph Mulvaney's wife, Mary Alice, well, she had a son from a previous marriage, and her son's name was John David Morris. I cannot find any photos of him. John David Morris was also known as Gabby. So the trunk that he owned, that was in his shed, that was locked, that he claimed he bought from a yard sale or a garage sale, contained the human remains of his own stepfather. However, this information wasn't even known to the public until 2017. There were rumors that Mary Alice was the one who shot uh, Joseph, and that she had her son, John David Morris, put the body in a trunk and hide it. And I guess this theory was just sort of around the idea that Joseph and Mary Alice had, were having some marital issues and that could have been her motive. However, that theory has never been confirmed, never been corroborated. Mary Alice died in 2009, well before any of this information came out. Gabby, John David Morris, well, his whereabouts seemed to be unknown. 
There were rumors that a couple of years after the bones were found in the trunk that he ended his own life. But there are some people out there who are stating that he is in fact still alive out there. But that has never been confirmed and never been corroborated. Nobody knows where he is. There is a theory because he would have been about 16 years old when Joseph went missing or when he was killed. It sounds like there are people who believe that it was actually Gabby, John David Morris, who shot and killed Joseph, his own stepdad. But if he did it, nobody knows. Eventually, Joseph's remains were cremated and sent back to his family where they are now in Iowa. So the mystery about who was inside that trunk is solved. But the mystery of who put him in that trunk and who put that bullet in his head, that is a mystery that technically remains unsolved. He was stabbed and left for dead here at this boat ramp and the mystery still remains. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Jack Robinson. Viewer discretion is advised. Jack Robinson was born on July 24th, 1931. He was married one time in his life, but at the time of this case, he was not married. And he had one child, this is his daughter. And she said he was just the best father you could possibly have. He was a very respectful man. He actually served in the United States Air Force for over 25 years. Jack himself grew up with a very like humble lifestyle and he raised his daughter, Tammy, pretty much the same way. Taught her to be a, a good person caring and loving individual. And Tammy would eventually provide him with two grandsons. His grandkids adored him to pieces. They were always so excited when he came to visit them. His grandsons will always remember a time when he took them on a train ride because Jack himself never got to take a train before, but he always, he had a passion for trains. He loved them. And so he wanted him and his grandsons to have that experience for the first time together. And they had a wonderful time. When this case occurred, Jack was 65 years old and he was living in Columbia, South Carolina, while his daughter and his two grandsons lived in Florida. On August 17th, 1996, Tammy received a phone call that no child would ever want to receive. Her father was dead, but not just that, he was murdered. Somebody had stabbed him multiple times. It happened here near the Rosewood boat landing at the end of Rosewood Drive, which is in the Richland County area in South Carolina. Jack drove there in his white Dodge Dynasty, and witnesses, at least three witnesses, said they saw Jack uh, meeting there with a younger man. The witnesses then saw Jack and this uh, younger guy go into kind of a clearing where the witnesses overheard an argument. The two of them were fighting over something. And then they could hear one of them screaming, what do you want? And then they heard like blood curdling screams. Then the witnesses saw Jack stumbling out of the clearing, clutching his abdomen, and there was blood all over his shirt. When they approached him, the other man had taken off. He ran. But Jack had clearly been stabbed in his stomach. So an ambulance was called. He was rushed to the hospital. But Jack Robinson, just a short time later, was pronounced dead. The witnesses would help provide police with a description which led to this composite drawing of the man that was seen with Jack. Described to be somewhere between 25 and 35 years old, a Latino male approximately 5 foot 10 and around 160 pounds. He had a thin mustache and was wearing like aviator style glasses. Based on the interaction that the people overheard and just based on physical body language that they observed between Jack and this man, they believed it looked as if Jack knew him, like if they already had an established friendship, acquaintance, relationship, something. But nobody in Jack's life knew who this man was. There is a belief that Jack and this unknown man may have had a physical relationship. According to Tammy, Jack's daughter, Jack had frequented gay bars in the area in South Carolina, and that that boat landing may have been a potential hangout spot for that community. But that, I don't know if you've ever been able to kind of discern whether or not this was some sort of a gay relationship. Robbery wasn't exactly a, a motive that was considered because Jack almost never had cash on him. And even if he did, he was someone who would just literally give it away if they asked him. Like he wouldn't put his life in jeopardy over a few bucks of cash. About a year after the murder happened, Tammy was informed that a man was arrested and charged with one particular murder and that this man was a person of interest in her father's murder. But then she found out that that man was never ended up being charged in Jack's murder because there was no evidence to show that this man was the guilty party. It's now been about 28 years and there are still no answers in who did this to him. They have received tips and leads, but nothing has come from them. 
They don't know what the motive was for this. Did it have something to do with him visiting a gay bar? Did it have something to do with a potential robbery? Was this a random chance encounter? Well, the motive seems to be just as mysterious as the who done it. So this is the initial composite drawing, and then this is a more digital recent one, and then they've done an age progression photo on it. Somebody somewhere out there knows the truth, and perhaps that someone is you. Tammy herself is now in her 60s, and she just wants justice for her father. If you have any information on the murder of Jack Robinson, please call 803-576-3073. Please help Jack Robinson and his family get the justice he rightfully deserves. All signs point to murder, but they said she did it to herself. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Janice Wilhelm. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Janice Wilhelm was a 63-year-old retired nurse, and she was living in Centerville, Texas, with her husband, Gerald. Janice had recently suffered from a stroke, and she had a large tumor um, surgically removed from her body, and all of this made uh, mobility very difficult for her. She had very little strength, especially in her arms. The tumor was removed from her left arm, which was her dominant arm. So she had to basically learn how to use her right arm for things, even though that one still didn't have enough strength. She moved around the house with a walker. She was also on a lot of medications, including pain medicine. On December 8th, 2010, the police in Centerville, Texas, get a phone call from Gerald Wilhelm. Gerald very calmly, almost nonchalantly, tells them that he thinks his wife is dead. He himself said he was taking a nap in the same room that Janice was in, and he just woke up and found her bloodied. This is because Janice had a gunshot wound through her neck. The wound entered the left side of her neck, and the angle from which the bullet went, it went through her lung and also severed her spine. The gun was found five feet away from where she was. The casing was found around the back of the couch. Now, the officers actually arrived after, I guess, fire and rescue arrived, which some people think is odd because of how rural this area is. Uh, just in terms of how fast they got there, it just seemed kind of strange. But they ruled her death immediately, a suicide. And they closed the case within hours. It was done. But Janice's family completely disagree with this. So like I said earlier, she could not really use her left hand. So the fact that she was shot through the left side of her neck at a very strange angle, she could not physically have taken her arm and put it in the angle it would have needed to be in in order to do that. Nor would she have the strength to actually pull the trigger from her left hand. It just was not going to be possible for her to do that. On the 911 call, Gerald said that she was depressed and she was now completely out of medication. But when there are photos taken, you can clearly see she has all of her medication. It was just a strange thing to lie about. Police also claimed they collected her suicide note. It took the family, her kids, having to do a lot of work to get access to this so-called suicide note because police were not cooperating with them. Anytime they entered the police station to talk about their mom's case, they would have them leave. They wouldn't give them any evidence, wouldn't show them any crime scene photos, wouldn't give them the suicide note. Well, finally, after a large battle, they finally got the note. It wasn't a suicide note. This is the so-called note. What this is, is actually some of Janice's old records and notes from when she was a nurse. She just had them next to her chair. But how they called this a suicide note is insane to me. It's not like it's... Ugh. But also, the gun being found five feet away, very suspicious, very strange. What's most strange of all is that Janice had her hands and arms completely tucked under her blanket. Meaning, if she lifted that gun and ended her own life with it, how on earth did her hands get underneath the blanket again? Gerald said he did not touch her, he did not touch the gun or anything. He just observed what he saw from afar and called 911. And then there was the matter of the will, basically leaving everything to her husband, Gerald. Well, her kids and her family would hire someone to look into this will, and the experts would declare that this was a forged note, meaning the writing on the will was not hers. Signature was not Janice's. Somebody else forged that signature. What was the motive if she was killed? Well, that seems to be a little kind of up in the air. You see, Janice's house apparently was on top of a lot of oil. She was 
contacted many times about installing an oil rig on her property. She always said no. They kept hassling her. We need you to put an oil well on your property. She says no, no, no. They even offered her a bunch of money and she still said no. And this was, we're talking millions of dollars worth of oil under this property. That's a lot of money for some people, bigwigs in the area. And now she turns up dead. A couple of months after her death, Gerald allows the oil companies to put an oil well on the property. In just one month after they first did this, the royalty payout was $126,000 from just one month. That is motive. That is a reason why someone would kill someone who did not want certain people to collect all this money. But the Leon County Sheriff's Department, the police there said, case closed, she did it to herself, end of story. Despite all of the physical evidence not pointing to that, there's no way she could have pulled the trigger, there's no way she could have put that gun to the left side of her neck. How was the gun five feet from her body? How was that spent casing behind a couch? How did you claim there was a suicide note when in fact it was just old nursing notes? How were her hands underneath her blanket? Anyone with eyes and just some intelligence can tell you that's murder. The, the problem though is, is who did it? Well, more than likely Gerald. He probably wanted to collect on that money that he, you know, they would have gotten from the oil. And then of course the will. Janice's kids hired a private, I guess, crime scene consultant. They tried to recreate the scene, the scenario in which they said she did it to herself. They couldn't recreate it. Everything pointed to the fact that somebody else had to pull that trigger. But still, the police and the sheriff's department out there, nope, not reopening this, it's done. In 2017, Gerald died. It says he died under mysterious circumstances, but the, I guess, coroner ruled it related to his heart. But he was immediately cremated, so there's no way anyone could do an autopsy on him. Did the powers that be also murder him so that he wasn't getting any cut of the money from the oil? Maybe. Maybe he was going to talk, so he had to be silenced. Who knows? And apparently there is a lot more cases similar to this in that general area. A lot of murders that were ruled suicides, or alleged murders ruled that way. This wasn't just a one-off case. And there's a lot of allegations of some extreme corruption going on in this area. I just cannot believe that Janice did this to herself. It's just the evidence, just, it's, it's not possible. Someone did it to her. And the motive is right there in your face. Money, oil, millions of dollars. People have killed for a lot less. So now her family is still trying to get them to reopen her case. So um, what you can do to help this is to call the medical examiner's office. You can leave them a message. So you can call 214-920-5900. And perhaps one day they will finally get the answers they've been looking for. And that one day they will finally get justice for Janice. He was on the run for four years, but he was finally brought to justice. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Gene Weaver. Viewer discretion is advised. Gene and Gordon Weaver had been married for about 17 years or so. Gordon and Jim Weaver lived here in White Bear Lake, Minnesota, and they had started a family. Gene was definitely the breadwinner of the family. Gordon came from wealthy parents, but he himself always struggled financially, always had money issues. And quite honestly, he relied on Gene. But after 17 years of marriage, Jean was pretty much just done with him, with Gordon. And according to later testimony, Jean was going to be filing for divorce. She was leaving him, which meant that Gordon was going to be out a lot of money, potentially, seeing as how basically she supported him. On October 16th, 1999, Jean was supposed to meet her sister, Kathy, along with other family members at a family gathering at a cabin nearby. However, Jean never showed up. This was very unusual for Jean because she was an incredibly punctual person. So her family just knew right away, they had a gut feeling that something was wrong. So they end up driving to Gordon and Jean's home. The front door is locked. They knock on the door, but they get no response. When Kathy peers into the house through a window, she can see a whole bunch of smoke. So immediately they rush to call 911. And firefighters enter the home. It is completely full of smoke. You can't even see a few feet ahead of you. And as they're going down towards the basement, they find a body. A body soon identified as Jean Weaver. She was deceased. 
The coroner would find a she had some blunt force trauma to her head as if she was either struck with something or pushed into something. And she also died of smoke inhalation. So when that fire was set, she was still alive. They also determined that the fire was set deliberately. Now, thankfully, her teenage son was not home at the time. Gordon arrives home after police finally get a hold of him. And he said he was out running errands and he was devastated that this happened. He doesn't know who would do this or, or why, but police weren't buying it. So they began looking into Gordon and his financials. Well, they discovered that Gordon would benefit from, you guessed it, a life insurance policy in the event that Jean died. As a matter of fact, there were two life insurance policies on her, one of them being for accidental death. This would have gotten him about $380,000 plus a 401k that had about 35,000 in it. Those two life insurance policies were actually set to lapse. When? Just two days after she was killed. The timing was impeccable. They also found out through their investigation that they were having some severe marital issues, that she was going to be leaving him. And so what they believe happened, based on the blunt force trauma to her head, they believe that the two of them got into some kind of argument and that he likely pushed her into something, like a, uh, like a countertop, something like that. And thinking she was dead, he just set her on fire. But she was still alive when he did that. And then he fled the house. Didn't call for help or anything. Which definitely makes people think mm, this was probably something he was planning to possibly do. So Gordon was arrested and charged with her murder. Specifically first degree murder. But thanks to Gordon having some really rich parents, they bailed him out. And he was out there free as a bird while awaiting a trial for first degree murder. Two days before a pre-trial hearing, Gordon Weaver vanished. According to his parents, uh, he took their RAV4, which two days later, they found the car. This is a recreation. They found blood in the car in a few different locations. There was debit and credit cards thrown all over the car. This appeared to them, possibly, that Gordon was carjacked and it led to some kind of physical altercation where he was killed. But there was no sign of him anywhere. No traces of him. They believe that Gordon Weaver actually staged this and that he faked his death. And that's when the FBI found out that from a friend of Gordon's that it was confirmed that Gordon was still alive. So Gordon Weaver was put on the FBI's most wanted list. And for four years, he was on the run. In May of 2004, near the area of Florence, Oregon, Gordon was found. He was living a new life under the name David Carson. And it was someone who had known him in Oregon that actually saw him on America's Most Wanted, and they turned him in. So he was captured then, and then in 2005, he admitted to being responsible for Gene's death. He said what the police thought. They got into a fight, and he accidentally pushed her into something where her head struck like a counter, and then he thought she was dead, and then he lit her on fire. Again, without calling for help first because that's what a person would do if they thought, oh my God, I might've just killed someone, but I'm not sure. You call 911 if you genuinely don't want that person to die. So he was convicted of the murder, second degree murder, and he got 25 years in prison. In 2007, his conviction was overturned. This was due to, I guess, d his defense team was very deficient. They weren't great. So he was awarded a new trial. In 2010, he was once again found guilty of the murder of Jean, but this time he was sentenced to 18 years in prison, credit time served. In 2016, he was released on parole. His parole period ended in 2023. Now, at one point, his parents were actually arrested and charged because they found out that they aided and abetted him escaping, but I don't know the exact outcome of what happened there. 18 years, that's it. If he had accidentally pushed her and he called 911 and got her help, she would have been fine. She would have lived, probably. He didn't do that. He didn't even check for a pulse or anything. He just said, oh, I probably killed her, so let's light her on fire and then lie about it afterwards. 18 years is nothing. That's a slap on the wrist. And now he is out there free as a bird. They know exactly who killed her, but they have no idea where he is. Hello, True Crimer-ers. This is the case of Joellen Weigel. Viewer discretion is advised.
This case occurred here in the Lake Winnebago area of Missouri, which is where 18-year-old Joe Ellen Weigel grew up. She had recently graduated from Lee's Summit High School, where she had been dating this guy here, Mike Klein, for about a year. The young couple, who was seemingly happy, planned to get married. He proposed to her and she accepted. Mike Klein came from a very wealthy family. They had a lot of money. Joe Ellen had a more humble upbringing, but that never seemed to get in the way of their love. It was July 2nd, 1970. Joe Ellen had told her family that she was going to be going on a date with her fiance, Mike. And then she told her parents afterwards she's going to be going over to a friend's house where she was going to spend the night. After dinner, Joe Ellen and Mike apparently got into some kind of argument where they were fighting for about 20 minutes. But no one really seems to know exactly what they were arguing about. No one saw Joe Ellen ever again alive after this. Within a day, her family became immediately concerned. This wasn't like her to not come back home, to not contact us. So they tried to report her missing to police, but they said she's 18 and it's, she hasn't been missing long enough. Well, Mike told people that while well, me and Joe Ellen, we eloped, we got married. And then she had gone to visit a relative kind of uh, on the spot. But when they contacted that relative, they were like, no, there was no arrangement, no plans for Joe Ellen to come here. No relative had any plans to, you know, have Joe Ellen come over. So they knew that Mike was lying. Well, then he changes his story. Uh, nah, I don't know where she went now. I have no idea. Three days later, in Lake Winnebago, a body was pulled from the lake. It had been weighed down with cinder blocks and filled up water jugs. The body would soon be identified as 18-year-old Joe Ellen Weigel. The autopsy would show that Joe Ellen was strangled to death. A ski rope was found tied around her leg. She was bound, which is actually identical to a rope they found on Mike Klein's own speedboat. The cinder block matched cinder blocks that his friend had at his house. In Mike Klein's vehicle, they found a towel, and when they unwrapped that towel, they found hair. Hair that was microscopically similar to Joe Ellen's hair. And it was evident that it had been pulled out of someone's head forcefully because it had been pulled out by the root. The day that Joe Ellen's body was found, Mike took a trip. He went all the way to Europe. He definitely was not playing the role of the concerned fiance. When he got back from his trip, police brought him in for questioning where he basically would refuse to answer most of their questions because that's what his lawyer told him to do. On July 24th, he was officially indicted and charged with the murder of his fiance. But before they could arrest him, Mike vanished and he has never been seen again. There was a point where they believed that he was using a new name and enrolled at a college at some point in the late 70s, but they could not corroborate that. They have reason to believe, I guess based on tips and information they've gotten over the years, that Mike might be working in the medical field, maybe as a veterinarian. At the time he went missing, he was five foot nine, weighed about 130 pounds, and he looked basically like this. Oh God. Uh, this is an age progression, sort of, of his image. However, I don't have a more recent one, but Mike would be in his, like, 60s or 70s at this point. The police believe that Mike Klein's family assisted him in escaping, that his family knows exactly where he went after all of this came out. His dad died in 1988, taking whatever information he may have had with him to the grave. I don't know the status of his mom, though. There have been rumors and tips that says that he may be somewhere in Latin America, but he's never been located. Sadly, Joe Ellen's parents passed away and they never got justice for her daughter. And to this day, Mike Klein is still somewhere out there. He may be dead, but there's also a very good chance he's still alive. So again, he may look something relatively similar to this, but older. If you have any information on Mike Klein's whereabouts, please call. 816-537-7900. You can always report your information anonymously. You do not have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. Please help Joellen and her remaining family get the justice she rightfully deserves. I no longer think that the John JonBenet Ramsey murder was an inside job. Why do you think that, Mike? I just watched the new Netflix docuseries. It's three episodes long. It's called Cold Case, Who Killed John JonBenet Ramsey? 
It premiered just the other day, and it does not really push the case forward by any means. It doesn't, like, offer us any suspects that we hadn't already heard of. But what it does do is it paints a, uh, a, big, a bigger picture, a picture that I never realized how bad it was. And what I mean by that is how bad the police investigation into this murder was. John and Patsy Ramsey were accused of killing Jean Benet pretty much from the get-go. The police really wanted it to be them. They needed it to be them. The media ran with this. The media said they were the ones who did it. They killed Jean Benet. And then we, as consumers, I guess, to this story, kind of went, yeah, okay, makes sense. It, it, it checks out. But then when you watch three hours of this docuseries, you realized, wow, these police are fucking awful. I mean, truly fucking awful. Here's something I didn't know. I knew that Jean Benet was found in the basement. What I never really knew was that her father, John, found her, picked her up, and brought her to the living room. And in doing so, destroyed a lot of potential evidence. But he was also like a father, like, oh my god, there's my daughter. She might still be alive. I gotta get her help. But why was it him who found her in the basement when the police had already gone through the house to search for her? Well, it turns out that the train room portion of the basement where Jean Benet was found, well, police never opened that door during their initial search. So she would have been found hours earlier had they been more thorough. They also let people go in and out of this house like a madhouse, contaminating evidence. While many people were stating that this could have been an outside job, an intruder did this. Well, police were like, well, that's impossible because there's no footprints in the snow. Media ran with the whole no footprints in the snow thing. What the media and the police didn't tell you, though, was that the snow on the front yard was like a really thin blanket, and it was very just kind of in, in patches. There was no snow, however, not a single piece of snow anywhere in the back portion of the house, where the intruder, the killer, would have likely entered. So, of course, there wouldn't be footprints in the snow when there was no snow. Then you had, holy shit, crazy eyes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You had this lady detective who basically said, ah, oh, it was John, he did it. I got bad vibes from him. That's why I think he did it. She had the nerve to say John gave her crazy eyes. The fuck? Then they did a, I didn't know they did this, on one on some random daytime talk show, whatever. They did this whole uh, public trial of Patsy and John Ramsey. And one of the main people in this was this lady here. And they were trying to say that... Uh, Jean Benet being involved in these uh, child beauty pageants, well, it was a form of child abuse. They were sexualizing their own daughter. And that this lady said that Jean Benet had to have been sexually, you know, molested by her father. Why did she say that? Because there is a, a video she watched of Jean Benet in a costume playing the saxophone. This lady had the nerve to say, clearly, Jean Benet is pleasuring herself with the saxophone on camera. She, what? Did we watch the same video? She was doing the whole thing. You know, like what you do when you're playing saxophone? She was impersonating that. This woman said that she put the saxophone all the way in between her legs and was basically grinding it. What? That didn't happen at all. But all of this was to paint the Ramses in bad light and convince us that they are guilty. That being said, there was DNA found on several pieces of evidence with Jean Benet's body, including her underwear. None of that DNA ever matched any of the Ramseys in the household, including the parents and her brother, Burke. By the way, the brother, uh, the whole Burke thing, the docuseries talks about it for about five total minutes because that's about all the time it deserves to get. I feel bad for ever even thinking that he was guilty. That whole uh, Burke Ramsey did it thing came from a CBS news report on this case where they just directly blamed him. And they said some stupid reason because, oh, she ate the last part of his dessert and he got mad and so he beat her over the head with a flashlight. Okay, but she was also sexually assaulted with a, um, a piece of wood and she had a garrote uh, around her neck very forcefully that it dug into her throat. You couldn't even see the rope of how deep it was buried. A nine-year-old boy isn't gonna do any of that. And also, did Burke write the ransom note? No. And that's the other thing, the ransom note. This is the one thing, the one thing that really throws this entire thing off. This is what makes this entire case so baffling. Why was this note there? If whoever killed Jean Benet already knew she was dead and already knew she was dead in the house and very, wasn't even hidden, what would be the point of this note? It's still baffling to me. By the way, there have been experts who have analyzed the handwriting, they've compared it to both John's handwriting and Patsy's handwriting, and there's never been a conclusive match to say that either of them wrote this note. Who did, though? Who the hell knows? 
there are some odd things about it though. Like why is it so long? Ransom notes are never this long. They're usually like a paragraph, not two and a half pages. The ransom also demanded a very specific amount of money, $118,000. No one ever requests that type of money like that. It's usually an, an even number. Well, that $118,000 just so happened to coincide with a bonus that John was getting for Christmas. But what I didn't know is that that information was actually out on a desk in John's office, that if there was an intruder in their home, they could have easily seen that and then added that to their note. The other bit of information I wasn't really so well versed on is the fact that on her body, on her back, and also I think right behind her ears, there were the same exact identical puncture wounds or what looked like puncture wounds. Later it turns out to have been from a taser. Why would John or Patsy need to taser their own daughter twice to bring her into another room in the house? You do that to incapacitate someone, and that would be someone who did not know Jean Benet. This guy here, he investigated this case. He never believed the Ramses killed their daughter. He always believed it was an outside person. He showed how the killer could have opened up a grate that would have led down to the basement window, which the basement window was left open. Also, it was broken. But he showed how easy it was for someone to enter the house. But the police didn't want to hear any of it. They just wanted them to be guilty because that's probably the easiest thing to do. The media blames them. The police blames them. It's them. These people were so bad. They refused to really investigate any other option. They did look into some like sex predators who were in the area, but that's about all they did. It just had to be them. The handwriting did not match either of them. None of the DNA found with the actual body matched them. Then you have this guy, John Mark Carr. Now they played audio in this Netflix series that I had never heard before. They played audio of him going basically detail by detail about how he killed John Bonet. He offered information that nobody should have known. He knew a nickname that Jean Bonet gave her grandma that nobody else knew. He confessed to it and he swore up and down he was the one to do it. He was in the area when this happened. He was eventually found and caught overseas and then brought back to the States. Then they tested his DNA. It wasn't a match to any of the DNA found at the crime scene. But then they would basically reveal that the DNA found with the body was basically contaminated. Because of how shitty the police were and how people were just going in and out, the way they handled evidence with gloves, without gloves, just random people coming in and out of the house, like family members, friends. There's no way you could look at the DNA and go, okay, this is conclusive. What they haven't done yet is they haven't tested things like the garrote, the paintbrush that was used to form the garrote and also was used to put inside Jean Benet. They are being told, please test all of these new items for DNA. But they're like, meh, we'll do it at some point, I guess. Like they're not moving with it. They're not, they're not, they're not doing anything. And this guy basically continues to swear he's the one who did it. And now he's somewhere back overseas because they released him because the DNA cleared him, allegedly. And he basically stated that he got into the house around 5 p.m. He broke in through the window. He told him exactly how he did it which all checked out. The family was at a Christmas dinner at another person's house. He says they came home around 10 p.m., which that confirmed as when they came home. So he had about five hours to walk through that house, look at John's office, see the, the $118,000 thing. He probably wrote that note um, in, in advance planning to kidnap Jean Benet because their house is an absolute maze. I did not realize how much of a clusterfuck of a maze that house was. But he had five hours to learn his way around the home to find out where, you know, to get to her bedroom easily. So when the family came home, he just sort of lied in wait and waited for them all to go to bed. Then he did his thing. He tased Jean Benet, brought her down to the basement, probably planning to kidnap her. But then he said some really sick and disturbing shit on this audio recording about how he felt about Jean Benet. It's, it's disturbing. And then one thing led to another where he ended up killing her. This guy seems like way more of a suspect than these two ever did. Yeah, I was part of the people who thought, no, oh, yeah, they probably did something to her. And it was really that ransom note that had me convinced because why would the killer leave that? Why would they do that? It was written on their stationery that they had in their house, but the guy had access to their house. But it wouldn't make sense for her to write that letter knowing full well her daughter is right down the basement, not even remotely hidden. Is it still possible they may have been involved? Sure, but I don't, I don't think they are anymore. Not them, certainly not Burke. I got, they even accused him of killing one of his other daughters who died in a car accident, saying that he was molesting her and so she died, you know, mysteriously. Sick. Anyway, this is 10 minutes long, sorry, but still watch it. <laughs> Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Julie Dalton Johnson. Viewer discretion is advised.
This case occurred in Kokomo, which is in Indiana, and it occurred in 1991. Unfortunately, I have very little information about this case. At that time, Julie Johnson had four kids, and apparently she was going through a divorce. She was living at the Kokomo Regency Trailer Park with her kids. On the night of March 1st, 1991, she actually took the kids to go see a movie, and then afterwards they came back to their home. Julie put the kids to bed, and then she was never seen again. Julie's husband reportedly reported her missing the following day, and that same day that she was reported missing, about three miles from their home, Julie's light blue Chevrolet Citation, this is not her exact car, but it, it was found. The car was locked, there was no signs of a struggle, no sign that a crime occurred in the car, no blood or anything like that. They did find her purse, the keys, and some of her belongings in there, but it was in a location that really didn't make sense as to why it was there. And most importantly, Julie was nowhere around the car. I can't 100% confirm this, but apparently the divorce proceedings between her and her husband were set to start a couple of days after her disappearance. But I'm not sure how accurate that is. But I don't see any mention where her husband or soon-to-be ex-husband had any involvement in her disappearance. There's actually very little uh, posted about this case. There was speculation, however, that alleged serial killer Larry Hall may have been responsible for Julie's murder. However, that's never been officially corroborated or anything. It's really just a rumor and a theory. And to this day, Julie has never been found. No trace of Julie has ever been found. She was just there one night, and then all of a sudden, like that, she was gone. But that can't happen. People cannot just vanish into thin air. Someone has to know what happened to Julie that night. There is a wide belief that she met with foul play. She had four kids. She loved them dearly. She would never just leave them. All of her belongings were left behind. Why was her car three miles away in a spot that didn't make sense as to where it was? It all screams foul play, but in terms of who did whatever to her is unknown. It is still a mystery to this very day. Somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth, and perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Julie Dalton Johnson, please call 765-456-2031. She was left on the side of the road for all to see, and the mystery still remains who put her there. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Karen Bodine. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Karen Bodine was a 37-year-old mother to two children. Um, at the time of this case, her kids are actually both teenagers. Uh, one is 15 and one is 18. Karen was an absolutely loving mother. She adored her two girls. There was actually a story I read that one of her daughters at school, um, she got in trouble because she had pink streaks in her hair. And so Karen, what she did to support her daughter was she put pink streaks in her hair. Karen was also known to leave like these little post-it notes in her daughter's lunch boxes or lunch bags just as a way to say, hey, I'm thinking about you. Karen was creative, full of life, and she was loved by many, many people. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, the worst happens. It was January 23rd, 2007 in Rochester, Washington about 30 miles away from where Karen actually lived with her daughters. Passerbys on this road noticed a body just on the side of the road. There were no attempts to hide this body. As a matter of fact, it appeared the body was potentially posed, almost like a slap in the face. The body was nude. She had bruises and cuts on her body, and the coroner would ultimately determine that she was strangled to death. The remains were soon identified as 37-year-old Karen Bodine. There was no evidence that Karen was sexually assaulted, however, but it is clear that she had gone through something that night. In their investigation, police found out that Karen was at a house uh, the night before she was found. Karen was last seen at that house at around 3 o'clock in the morning, and then she was found sometime later that morning. The house she was at, I guess, was considered like a party house. And this was a place where either the owners of the house or just the people who frequented it, I guess, were known to dabble in drugs from time to time. I am assuming police have been able to talk to at least a few people who were at the house that night, but I don't know exactly how many people were there. Police also confirmed that they themselves spoke to Karen roughly 24 hours before her body was found. 
somebody had called in a welfare check on her because she was walking down the road and it was freezing cold and she wasn't wearing any kind of cold weather clothing. She wasn't wearing a jacket or anything. So police kind of just found her on the road and said, hey, are you okay? And she's like, yeah, I'm fine. And she just sort of brushed him off. And then 24 hours later, she's found dead. Unfortunately, the police department in this area is very understaffed, or at least was back then, and also back then very underfunded. They did not have a lot of resources. They didn't have a lot of personnel. And so investigating this case became kind of difficult. But it still hasn't stopped her now adult daughters and the police today from trying to find out who did this to her. I do know that at some point in the past five or six years or so, um, a cold case team has sent a whole bunch of items to a DNA crime lab to see if they can get any kind of DNA profiles. But as of right now, I don't know if there's any update on that. I don't really see anywhere where it states that, you know, we have a one male profile or two male profiles and they may still be trying to work on even getting DNA. It is possible that someone at that house where she was at did this to her or multiple people at that house did this to her. Like I said, she, it looked as if she had gone through something that night, some kind of struggle. Karen was not the type of person to just sit by as someone attacked her or was, you know, messing with her. She would fight back, rightfully so. And based on how she was found, it looked like she did put up a hell of a fight. But in terms of who did that to her, why, is still unknown. To this day, they still have a memorial up there on that part of the road where she was found. And her now adult daughters have come out and said, we are going to find you. Her daughters believe that whoever killed their mom is still in that community. And they have basically said, you know, in the media to whoever the killer is, you've done this to the wrong family and we are coming for you and we will get you. It's just a matter of time. They are doing all sorts of incredible things now with DNA, taking even the tiniest, idiest, bittiest sample and they're able to take that sample and find a suspect. Now we have genetic genealogy. They have the you know, Ancestry.com websites and they can trace DNA back to certain families. And so really it is a matter of time before this killer is found. You are out there somewhere. And more than likely that killer has told people. And more than likely multiple people were involved in either killing her or helping hide her or dump her body. They did not hide her body. They made no efforts to hide her body. It's been about 16, 17 years since Karen Bodine was killed. Unless some kind of tragedy befell her killer, that person is still out there alive somewhere. And maybe you were associated with that person back then, but no longer are. Maybe you've been afraid to come forward because of potential retaliation. Maybe you fear for your life. Well, you can report your information anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. All you have to tell is what you know. And it has to help lead to the capture of Karen's killer or killers. So if you have any information on the murder of Karen Bodine, please call 1-800-222-TIPS or 1-800-222-8477. Help Karen and her daughters get the justice she rightfully deserves. This man has been wanted for a triple homicide for nearly 30 years. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Kevin Vermette. Viewer discretion is advised. So this case occurred in, forgive me if I say this wrong, in Kitimet, up here in British Columbia, Canada. It was July 12th, 1997, and this occurred here at Hirsch Creek Park. Four friends pictured here were hanging out at that park, when suddenly a man walks up to them with a gun and begins to shoot them. The shooter makes contact with all four men. Other campers and hikers in the area heard the gunshots and they immediately went to contact police. When police arrived, they find four men on the ground. Three of them are already deceased. Mike Morrow, David Nunez, and Mark Tevez, all in their early 20s. The other man, Dan Oliveira, also in his early 20s, was still alive. He was rushed to the hospital and he was able to be saved. Based on witness accounts, they would discover that the shooter was this man here, Kevin Vermet. He was 43 years old at the time of this case. Apparently, at some point before all of this, Kevin Vermet had gotten into some kind of verbal altercation with the four men. This was at a completely different place. They were allegedly playing music very loudly in a weight room. And so there was turmoil between Kevin and these four men. Now, 
on the night in question on July 12th, the four men were actually going to be on their way to a party about 60 kilometers away from where they lived, but they ended up at Hearst Creek Park. And for reasons unknown, Kevin Vermette just so happened to also be at that same park at the same time, when he just walked up to them and began shooting them, killing three and severely injuring a fourth. Kevin Vermette, along with his dog, ran into the woods, according to witnesses. He abandoned his car there at the park, and he has never been seen since. He is now one of the most wanted men across Canada. He is considered armed and also very dangerous. He is the one and only suspect in this case. And he has been officially charged with three counts of second-degree murder and also one count of attempted murder. From what I understand, Canada, like the United States, does not have a statute of limitations on murder. Meaning that whenever this man is found, no matter how old he is, he will still face justice. This is a more recent composite drawing of the man as to what he may look like today, and he would be in his 70s. There was speculation at first that Kevin Vermette went into the woods and just died. But he was an outdoorsman. He, he knew the outdoors very, very well. He knew the woods, the forests, very well. He would be able to navigate his way through it. And so there is belief by the RCMP that this man is still alive somewhere out there. However, no trace of him has ever been found. They have investigated about 30 to 40 tips and leads about people who have, think they have seen him, but none of those have come to any actual conclusions. No answers. So it is very possible that that man is still out there and alive. And he may look something very similar to this. He may look like this when you first met him, you know, 27 years ago, right after he escaped this murder. And you may have absolutely no idea that he is this horrible person. But he is, again, considered armed, dangerous, and violent. He is set off at like that. The RCMP has urged people that if you do see him, do not try to take him down yourself. Just contact the local authorities from wherever you are and let them do the work. Do not put your life at risk. Three men are dead and they deserve justice. One man is traumatized forever. He deserves justice. Somebody somewhere out there has got to know where this man is, if he is still alive. You may know him. You may even know him as your friendly neighbor, that sweet old guy down the road. There is a $25,000 reward for any information that helps lead to his capture. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Kevin Vermet, please call the RCMP in Canada at 250-632-7111. It is also very possible he may have found his way to the United States. If you know something, say something. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Knight Family Massacre. Viewer discretion is advised. So this case occurred in the Greenwood Village neighborhood of Denver, Colorado, back in 1958. 45-year-old Merrill Knight pictured here was a husband and a father. This was his wife, Regina. Their 18-year-old son, Kenneth and then their 15-year-old daughter, Karen. This was 29-year-old David Early. He was Merrill Knight's distant cousin. Now, Merrill Knight was an attorney, and he found out that his distant cousin, David Early, was in some sort of legal trouble, so he offered to help him. This was when David was in Kansas. David had been serving time in Kansas for an aggravated burglary. And so his lawyer cousin offered to help him kind of integrate back into the you know real world after he served his time. And he offered David to come to their home in Denver, Colorado and stay with them for some time. So David Early was released from prison on April 22nd, 1958. He would board a bus from Kansas and head to Denver, Colorado, where he would get to the Greenwood Village area. On April 25th, 1958, David Early arrived early to the night house and nobody was home. He entered the home through an unlocked back door where he decided, you know what? I'm gonna look for stuff to rob. And that's when he found a 22 caliber rifle. He thought, hmm, maybe I can use this. So he waited for the family to get home. Regina Knight was the first to return home. David Early accosted her with a gun and forced her to tie herself up and screamed at her, give me all the money you have. She's like, I only have $60, but David didn't believe her. Then, a short time later, the two children get home. David, with the gun, forces both of them to tie themselves up, and then he ties them to, like, a bed. Merrill Knight arrived home sometime between 5.30 p.m. and 6 p.m. Again, he, David Early, 
pointed the gun at him and said, you know, follow me. And then he tied him up as well. Throughout this entire thing, David basically manages to steal a couple hundred bucks worth of cash. He told the family, I'm going to sit here until it gets dark and then I'm going to leave and you're not going to be harmed. And then a knock at the door. A man named Varian Ashbra, who was, I guess, being represented by Merrill Knight, comes to the house. He was there to drop off some papers uh, for a transaction they were doing. He's actually greeted by David Early. He tells this man, uh, you know, uh, Merrill's indisposed right now. He's in the bathtub. Okay, well then, what about Mrs. Knight? Oh, uh, he says, uh, she's she can't come to the door right now either right now. So just give me the papers and I'll hand it to them. And so uh, Varian Ashbaugh leaves and heads to a dinner party he was scheduled to go to. Now, when this was happening, Merrill Knight managed to free himself from his bindings. When David Early came back to his area where he was tied up, he accosted David Early and tried to fight him and get the gun away from him. But in the fight, David Early fired several rounds, shooting Merrill Knight. He would be pronounced dead later that evening. Well, now there are witnesses, so now he has to get rid of them. He walks up to Mrs. Knight, points the gun directly at her head, and shoots her. He then goes to the 15-year-old daughter, points the gun directly at her, fires at close range, and kills her. 18-year-old Kenneth managed to free himself, and he actually escapes the house. As he's running, David Early comes out and fires at him, but he misses. The 18-year-old manages to get to the neighbor's home, which was not super close by, but it was the same home that that other man, Varian Ashbaugh, that's where he was going that night. So... Kenneth alerts everyone about what just happened, and then they all rush to the house. They see David Early fleeing the house in a car. They get into a car, and they chase him down, and they ram his car, the stolen car. And they manage to get David Early to jump out of the car and run. They were armed with a shotgun. The shotgun wasn't loaded, but they managed to basically corner him and point the gun at him. He doesn't realize it's not loaded. And he basically says, you got me in which the police shortly arrive after that, and he is arrested. Merrill, Regina, and Karen Knight are pronounced dead at the scene. David, early at the police station, they ask him, why'd you do this? He said, I need money. He actually tells them, and I would do the same thing again. If I was in the same situation, I'd still kill him. Despite him also writing in his parole papers when he was released from prison just you know a few days prior to this, that Merrill Knight was basically the only friend he had but he says he would kill him again if the circumstances were the same. What a guy. He goes on trial and the jury deliberates for about 20 minutes and they find him guilty of all three murders and he is sentenced to death. On August 11th, 1961, he is put into the gas chamber where they turn it on and within a few minutes, he is dead. His final words, I hope God will forgive me. Good riddance. Within a year of this photo being taken, one of the people pictured would be dead, and two of the people pictured would be the suspects. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Christy Gunderson Lee. Viewer discretion is advised. Christy Gunderson was born on September 4th, 1973. She was one of two kids. She had an older sister. Now, she was born in Virginia, but at an early age, the family would move to Texas. And eventually, in Texas, she would meet a man named Jeff Lee. Jeff was basically at that point recovering from being a drug addict, but the two of them hit it off and they soon had a child. In March of 1993, Jeff and Christy would get married. And by all accounts, they had a really great relationship. Christy was very supportive of Jeff and because of her support for him and with his you know, drug life being connected to Texas, she said, hey, let's move. So they ended up moving to Pompano Beach, Florida. Uh, and that's actually where Jeff's parents lived. So they moved in with Jeff's parents who are pictured over here. And that's Joe and Kay Petralia. Kay got work as a hairdresser and Jeff got a job at a travel agency. Both were doing really well. But what wasn't going well was the relationship between Kay and Christy. Kay Petralia was trying to be very controlling of how Christy raised her son, Zachary. She was constantly trying to meddle in Zachary's upbringing. And this caused arguments between Kay and Christy all the time. And it actually got physical one time when Kay pulled Christy's hair and it completely knocked her down to the ground. So at that point, Christy and Jeff moved out of Jeff's parents' house and got their own apartment. 
but Zachary still needed a sitter while the, you know, the two of them were working. So Joe and Kay, his grandparents, would babysit him. But Kay and Joe would still come by the apartment unannounced and try to, again, interfere with how Christy was raising Zachary. This was even starting to piss off Jeff. And it was just obvious that there was never going to be love between Christy and Kay especially. On the morning of March 31st, 1994, Kay and Joe Petralia would go to Christie's apartment. It was sometime like a little after 10 or 10.30 in the morning, and they discovered something horrific. Christie was dead, and it was an incredibly violent death. There was blood everywhere. The coroner would later determine that she had been struck several times with some kind of triangular object, and she had also been strangled. There was no evidence of any sexual assault. A couple of drawers and cabinets were left open, so it appeared at first to look like a robbery gone wrong, but then nothing was stolen, so not a single thing was taken from the house. No money, nothing. And so to them, it started to look like, oh, this was staged to look like a robbery gone wrong. And of course, the first person that police go to look at is her husband, Jeff. He was absolutely devastated by his wife's death, and, you know, this could have been a crime of passion, and he staged it to look like a robbery. But then they found out through his work that not only was he physically clocked in to work at, during the time the murder would have happened, but many different co-workers would come forward to say that he was absolutely there and present in that building at his desk when the murder occurred. So police at that point knew Jeff did not kill Christy. Police then turned their attention to Kay and Joe Petralia because they had found out about this really rocky relationship between Kay and Christy. Well, according to them, they had picked up uh, Zachary at about 8.30 that morning from Christy's apartment. And then they went back at about 10.30 a.m. and that's when they discovered her body. By their own accounts, they were there in the apartment between 8.30 and 9 a.m. And when they left, Christy was still alive, obviously. However, there would be numerous witnesses in the neighborhood who heard very loud screams coming from Christie's apartment. This would have happened around, they said, 8.30 to 9 o'clock in the morning when Joe and Kay, by their own accounts, were still in the apartment. So police asked them, will you take polygraph tests? They both said, absolutely not. Now, they could find no other suspects in this case. Kay and Joe Petralia were their only suspects. They knew Jeff had no involvement in this, not even like a he hired them to do it kind of thing. Their fingerprints would be in the apartment because they were there all the time. So even if they found some, it wouldn't have mattered. So there was no other physical evidence at that time connecting them to her murder. They really just had circumstantial evidence and the fact that Kay and Joe were not cooperating with police. And then police did discover that Jeff and Chrissy were planning on moving back to Texas to get away from Jeff's parents. And Kay found out, and she was extremely mad about this because now you're taking my grandson away. And then Christy ends up dead. After the murder, Jeff and Zachary do in fact move back to Texas and he has severed all ties with his parents. He feels that they are also the only suspects in this case, that they are the ones who did this, as do the police. There was some speculation that maybe this was involved with Jeff's past history with drugs, but all of his history came from Texas, and this happened in Florida, and nobody knew where he lived in Florida from his old life, and police were able to rule that possibility out pretty quickly. In 2000, Joe Petralia was arrested for domestic assault against his wife Kay, but then those charges were dropped. In 2004, I guess police would take um, some evidence from the crime scene and try to build up some DNA profiles, see if there's any DNA, but the results were apparently inconclusive, meaning they still had no physical evidence connecting these two to Christie's murder. In 2009, Joe Petralia dies. From my understanding, Kay Petralia is still alive, and it sounds like her whereabouts are currently unknown. Her and Joe are still considered the prime and pretty much only suspects in the murder of Christy. But somebody somewhere out there might have the information that helps lead police to solving this officially. Perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information on the murder of Christy Gunderson Lee, please call 954-321-4220.
Missing Kyron Horman is a TikTok page I would like for you all to follow. This is a TikTok page dedicated to telling the story and trying to find a missing seven-year-old boy named Kyron Horman. I have not covered his case on my page yet, but his case is on my list to cover. But I'm going to tag the uh, TikTok page below as well as a recent video of theirs so that you can go to their page, follow the account, give their videos some likes, do not spam like them because that ends up hurting the page, but share their stories, repost their videos. Seven-year-old Kyron Horman was last seen on June 4th, 2010 in Portland, Oregon. He had been dropped off at his elementary school by his stepmother, Terry. She claims she left the school at 8.45 a.m. and saw Kyron walking down the hallway towards his class, but Kyron never actually made it to his class. Now there is a lot of speculation about Terry's involvement in Kyron's disappearance. So again, the link to this TikTok page and one of the recent videos is right here in the description. Follow and repost. This is a true crime related TikTok page I would like for you all to follow if you haven't done so already. So this TikTok page is run by the mother of Layla Santanello. Now I covered Layla's case a long while back and I I believe I also did a live stream with Layla's mom as well. I'm not going to link my um, video below though because I want you to go to her page to watch her content. Um, so I will I will tag like a direct video below here in the description as well as just the page itself. Layla was last seen on June 27th, 2023 at approximately 6.15 a.m. in Kingsport, Tennessee, and she was last seen in a field which was next to an AmeriCorps uh, hotel or motel. I believe at first the uh, information came out that she was last seen near, I guess, the Marble Slab, which was like a, a business out there. But from what I can tell, police have later ruled that out, that that was actually another person, not Layla. So it's the field by the AmeriCorps where she was last seen. And if, you know, her mom will see this video, she can correct me if I said anything wrong here. But yeah, so it'd just be really cool if you can follow her page, check out her content, and do anything you can think of to help her find her daughter. Because every missing person deserves to be found. And every victim of a crime deserves justice. If you are aware of any other justice uh, TikTok pages for missing persons or uh, murder cases, unsolved cases, uh, please tag them in this video. Or you can go back to my pinned video with the first one I did. It's pinned at the top of my profile. It's the Justice for Dennis Wusanoff case. Because that way I can find that video quicker and easier. And just mention some to me or, or send me by email, DM me, whatever you got to do. That way I can make similar videos for these pages too. So yeah, please follow uh, this TikTok page and help her out. Awesome. Hello, True Crimeers. This is the case of Lee Johnson. Viewer discretion is advised. This case occurred in the area of Salina, Kansas. Unfortunately, I really have very little information and I only have one photo of the victim. At the time of this case, Les Johnson was 29 years old. He was one of two kids. He had a sister. Les would constantly be riding his mountain bike around the area. He absolutely loved being on that bike and he rode it everywhere. And that's exactly what he was doing on July 23rd, 2001. Les had been working at a construction site that day. He left early because he said he had jury duty to attend. So he got onto his bike, he left his the work site, and then he was never seen alive again. Les just vanished into the air, never to be seen. He never showed back up at work, he never got home, he never got to his jury duty, which they would later find out, oddly enough, was actually not scheduled for another week. So why did Les leave work saying he was going to jury duty on that particular day? That's really unknown. But a search for him began, but they were having no luck. Approximately six months later in an open like field, a teenage boy was walking in this field with a friend and they came across a skull. As they got closer, they realized there were human remains. This is not the actual image, this is just a stock photo. But there were scattered bones along with this skull and they knew right away that it was human. So they contacted the police. The McPherson County Sheriff's Department got involved right away and with a few, within a few days or so, they would confirm the identity of these remains. It was in fact, Lush Johnson. Now his cause of death either has not been revealed or they don't know his cause of death. But either way, they have ruled this death a homicide and they're treating this like a murder investigation. And then a month later, his mountain bike is found. Now apparently the bike was actually found in September and the people who found it brought it back home. But when they found out about, you know, this missing man and his mountain bike, then the remains were found. They brought the bike into the sheriff's department. 
There was no forensic evidence, unfortunately, on the bike. There was no forensic evidence whatsoever with his remains. The bike was found uh, quite a long distance away from where he was found. And his sister, his family thought that was extremely strange because there's no way he would ride his bike there and then just leave it. So they believe that either the bike was planted there to throw people off, or he did in fact ride the bike to that area for some reason that's unknown. And then something happened where he was taken or killed right there and then dumped in this pasture, this field. And really, they only have the most bare minimum of a theory or, uh, or a question. Why did he say he was going to jury duty that day when it wasn't scheduled for a week out? Did he himself just mix up the times? Or was he leaving to go meet someone else for some other reason that he did not want anyone else to know about? And then that person is what led to his death. It's unknown. And really, it's just people speculating because ultimately police have nothing. They have virtually no witnesses. They have no evidence. They don't have any tips coming in, not very many, not credible ones at least, but somebody killed him. Somebody killed him and dumped him in that field. But how did they do it? And why did they do it? And who is it? Well, somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth and perhaps that someone is you. This happened obviously over 20 years ago, but his killer or killers could very well still be out there. And maybe they have talked, maybe they have slipped, maybe they have said something by accident. And you could always report information that you know anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. So if you have information about the murder of Les Johnson, please call 1-800-241-8118. Within a day of this photo being taken, the woman pictured would be dead, but never found. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Liz Landy. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Liz Landy was 21 years old and she was living in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. After high school, she kind of fell in with the wrong crowd, specifically the Warlocks motorcycle gang, which led her to this man here, Robert Thomas Noss Jr. Robert would eventually become the vice president of this motorcycle group, and they would cause havoc and, you know, commit crimes throughout the area. Robert and Liz, you know, their relationship was off to a rocky start. He would become abusive towards her. Her friends and family would say, you need to stay away from him. But as we have said before, you know, relationships like this, abusive ones, especially when one of these people is like the head of a motorcycle gang, it's not exactly the easiest thing to just walk away from because you're going to fear for your life. It was December 10th, 1971. Liz's parents took this exact photo. Little did they know that this was the last picture they would ever take of their daughter. This is the last known photograph of Liz Landy. On December 11th, 1971, she would be hanging out with some friends, watching movies, when her boyfriend Robert called her and said, hey, come over. Her friends were like, please don't go. He's gonna hurt you. Don't go. But she decided to go anyway. According to a witness, Liz and Robert hung out at the apartment that Robert lived in with another uh, member of the biker gang. They watched movies and they took drugs. At one point, Liz very playfully just kicked or nudged Robert. And Robert didn't like that. It really pissed him off, even though she was just being silly. He would choke her until she passed out. And he thought he killed her. But shortly after this, she came to and she ran to the bathroom and locked herself in. For the next 15 minutes, Robert's banging on the door saying, get out, get out, get out, we need to talk. So finally she goes out of the bathroom and they have sex. After that is done, she tells him, listen, we can't do this anymore. I need to leave you. We need to not do this ever again. He didn't like that. Robert took a piece of wood and smashed it over her head, knocking her out. He then took a piece of rope, uh, put it around her neck, and he hung her from the rafters in the apartment building, and he watched her struggle as she choked and died. He then told a friend that he had just killed Liz, and he said to that friend, quote, See what I'd done? Now she won't bother me no more, end quote. The following morning, he shows the body to a neighbor slash friend. He then says to that friend, If you do not help me hide her body, I will kill you. And that friend's name was William Standen. So Robert and William, they take her body, wrap it up in a plastic sheet, put her in the trunk of their vehicle, and drive to a secluded location, where they then dig a shallow grave in this wooded area, and they bury her. Then they drop off a bag of all of her clothes that she was wearing when she was killed. They drop it off at another friend's house and says, 
dispose of this, burn it, set it all on fire. And that friend does that. He burns it all. Then they all go about their day. Now, when Liz's parents took this photograph, um, they did so knowing that they were going to be going on vacation the following morning. They were gone for about a week. When they came back, they realized that no one has heard or seen from Liz. All of her friends were trying to check in with her over the week, but never got in touch with her. The only person who never tried to find out where she was or why she wasn't responding to anyone was Robert. And obviously, it's because we know he killed her, but they didn't know that at the time. However, they strongly suspected he did something to her based on his abusiveness towards her. However, police did not have enough evidence to charge him with anything because they didn't even have her body. They didn't have a crime scene. Well, finally, in July of 1977, William Standen, the guy who helped Robert hide her body, comes forward to police and spills everything. Now, what I'm kind of confused by, though, is that I don't know if he attempted to take police to where they buried her body and she wasn't there, or if he just didn't remember, or I'm not, I'm not sure. But his evidence was enough to help police arrest Robert and charge him with her murder, and also with rape. So Robert Noss Jr. goes on trial, and he does not deny that he hid her body. He says that Liz was really depressed, and that night she decided to end her own life. And in order to prevent police from finding out about other crimes that he and a motorcycle gang had committed, he decided it was best to hide her body. Right. While in prison, he actually tells another inmate that they're never going to find her body because he actually dug her up, moved her to a different spot, cut out all of her teeth and cut off her hands so that she could not be identified. And through all of this, Liz Landy has never been found. Her body has never been recovered. But Robert Nash Jr. was found guilty and he was convicted of her murder. He became the very first person in the history of Pennsylvania to ever be convicted of murder without a body and without an eyewitness to the crime itself. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole. In 1983, Robert, while in prison with another inmate, they were working on a piece of furniture like a dresser. Well, they managed to hide themselves in that dresser, which then got loaded onto a truck and it got taken off prison grounds. These two men, Robert and this other guy, escaped prison. The other guy was found by 1986 or so and brought back to the prison. Robert's case airs on America's Most Wanted, and it's from that broadcast in 1990 in Michigan, they get a tip to where he is. He was living under a different name. He apparently got married and had two kids. And when police got to Michigan, they confirmed it was him. So he was arrested and brought back to Pennsylvania to serve out the rest of his sentence, which was life without parole. Meanwhile, Liz is still out there somewhere, never been found. She is alone and buried in some shallow grave. Her family and friends cannot visit her. They cannot pay their respects. But maybe, just maybe, somebody somewhere out there knows where she is. Maybe Robert talked. You can report information anonymously. They just want her home. They want to be able to bury her properly. So if you have information, please contact the police in Pennsylvania with anything you might know and help bring Liz home. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Marlena Childress. If your discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Marlena Childress was just four years old, and she lived with her mom in Union City, Tennessee. According to her mother and a few witnesses, Marlena was seen playing just outside on the front yard of her home on April 16, 1987. At approximately 3.30 p.m., Marlena's mother, Pam Bailey, said she heard the sounds of screeching tires and saw a car driving away. When she goes outside, Marlena is gone. After frantically searching the neighborhood for her daughter, she calls 911 and reports her missing at 4.15 p.m. Immediately, a massive police search begins. People from the neighborhood and other volunteers are assisting. They map out all the locations they've already searched. They are knocking door to door. This humongous search wields no results. Marlena is nowhere to be found. Her mother then goes on the news. I don't care if somebody got her. If anything's done to them, I just want her back. It felt and it seemed very genuine. Six days after Marlena's disappearance, a hundred miles away in Memphis, Tennessee, these two women here who worked at a hair salon there, they would later go on to tell police that they observed a woman walking into the hair salon 
with a young boy and a young girl. And there was a second woman there as well. One of the women was in their 20s, the other was in their 60s. The girl appeared to be about four years old. At one point, the hairdressers would state they heard the little girl saying, I want to go home, I want my mommy. And that one of these women, the younger one, referred to the little girl as Marlena. When they see a photo of Marlena in a newspaper, they immediately both go, that's the little girl we saw, we're sure of it. At that point, Marlena's grandfather became involved and he was investigating certain things on his own. He finds out about these two women who think they saw Marlena. He then travels out there himself. He interviews them and then through that he also learns about a local waitress in the area and he begins to suspect that this waitress may have been involved in Marlena's disappearance. So he shows a photo of this waitress to these two women here and they both identify the younger that woman as the younger woman they saw in the hair salon with the young girl they think is Marlena. And that young woman also has a young boy, which they also both confirmed visually through a picture was the same young boy they saw. However, nothing really ever came from this angle. From what I understand, I guess this waitress was ruled out and perhaps they're telling these two women that they didn't see who they thought they saw. I mean, that is possible. They could have just, you know, could have seen a little girl who looked really similar to Marlena, but a lot of it seemed to be pretty spot on. The emotional toll of her missing daughter would really weigh on Pam. So she ended up checking herself into a mental health institution. Nine days after she checks in, and this is about two months after Marlena's disappearance, Pam makes a very shocking announcement. Marlena is dead. How does she know that? Because she confessed to accidentally killing her the day she disappeared. She says that she killed her on accident and threw her body into the uh, local Obion River. So police conduct a very thorough search of the Obion River. The search lasts for days. They have expert divers and they're searching it from top to bottom. No sign of Marlena is ever found. Pam Bailey though is arrested and charged with second degree murder for the murder of her daughter. But then she comes out and says, up, oh, I'm changing my story. I'm going to recant. It was false. I was coerced. She comes up with different variations of stories about what happened. She said that she spoke to a private investigator named Stan Gavness and that he was the one to coerce the confession out of her. She said, I just gotten out of the hospital and I was an emotional wreck. And he forced me to do it. So he holds a press conference and he plays back the audio of her confession. Apparently he played a five minute snippet of this confession and nowhere in it did it sound in any way, shape or form that she was coerced. As a matter of fact, in the audio, she offered this information seemingly just out of nowhere and willingly, but Pam kept insisting it was coerced. He just didn't show you or record the part where he was coercing me, which is a possibility. But because she had recanted her confession and because Marlena had not been found and because there was no evidence of any kind of foul play at a crime scene anywhere, they had to drop charges and they released her. According to police, she changed her story a couple of times. One time she told people that she sold Marlena for a drug debt. Another story she told was that a family member abducted her. And then she has this confession about, I threw her in the river, I, I lost my temper and I hit her and she died. Just so many different stories. But then what about the sighting of Marlena with these two women? Well, she wasn't, they weren't the only ones. This woman here in 1989 also claims to have seen Marlena. Shortly after Marlena's disappearance, she was in a department store with her own child, and this was in Lenore City, Tennessee. She's trying to call her child over to come with her, but then a, a young girl walks up to her instead, and she has a very good look at this little girl. Well, later, when she finds out and she sees pictures of Marlena, she goes, oh my god, I think that's the young girl I saw, and that she saw this young girl going away with some younger woman. And then there was another sighting of her in 1990, all the way in Nevada. However, all three of these witness accounts that say they saw her, none of them could be confirmed or corroborated by police. Meaning they all could have seen what they thought they saw was her but wasn't. Maybe they did see her. But to this very day, Marlena has still never been found. So here's a crazy twist. Eventually, Pam moves to Kentucky and she has a son. In April of 2002, she is arrested for stabbing her son in a graveyard. According to the son, she allegedly told him that I have a surprise for you in this graveyard. She blindfolded him. She had him sit down on a grave with a tombstone that just said son. And then she just out of nowhere stabbed him. 
She was arrested for this. Her son survived. She pled no contest to attempted murder and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. She has since been released. With the exception of the initial charges she took after confessing, Pam Bailey has never been recharged or indicted or anything with connections to the disappearance of Marlena. However, based on this new thing with her stabbing her son, police do now firmly believe that she certainly had something to do with Marlena's disappearance and that her confession was likely true. However, there's been no proof. There's no body found. Again, no physical evidence. Mentally speaking, she's not exactly of sound mind. So it becomes really difficult to charge or indict someone with no evidence. If by chance Marlena is still alive today, she would look something similar to this. But the wide belief is that she is no longer alive. That she was likely killed the day she disappeared. If you have any information on her whereabouts, you can call 731-885-1515. He was found hunched over a rock and a bullet in his head. But the question is, was it murder or did he do it to himself? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Michael O'Mara. Viewer discretion is advised. Michael O'Mara was a very happily married man and he did have a child. He was a fantastic, doting, loving father. He was a perfect husband. There was no marital riff whatsoever. The 48-year-old man was once the captain of the Cook County Sheriff's Department in Chicago, Illinois. He was also the only person in that department at that time who had been trained at the FBI. O'Mara was a key figure in taking down many, many members of the mob. But by the time this case occurred, he is winding down his career and he is now doing a desk job. He was really on the verge of retirement, but he never would get to retirement. May 30th, 1988, sometime just before 9 p.m., a local patrolman was driving in the area when he pulled up to the courthouse's gas station, I guess that they use for themselves, and saw a vehicle that had the, uh, you know, with the nozzle in the tank as it was being filled up. However, whoever was filling up their car wasn't there. So this officer gets out of his car, he goes with his flashlight and begins to look around when in a field just outside of this gas station, he found someone hunched over a rock. When he got closer, this person was bloodied in the head. There was a gun next to the right side of his body and a flashlight next to his body. And it was more than evident that there was one single gunshot wound directly to the middle of his forehead. The man in the field was none other than Michael O'Mara. He was pronounced dead. In the field, there was no other signs of anyone else being there, but also it's a desolate field. I'm not sure how there would really be much evidence, you know, of maybe another person being there or not. But police could find no evidence that anyone else was at the scene when this all happened. His briefcase and his wallet were found intact, nothing stolen. His vehicle was still there, open, keys in the car, wasn't stolen. Within two weeks, the coroner would determine and rule that his death was, in fact, a suicide. That made no sense to his wife, that made no sense to his co-workers, that made no sense to his friends or anyone in his life. That night, his wife said that Michael left the house with his briefcase and he was going to go out and get some yogurt for the family. But it was the day before payday, he did not have money with him. So he calls out for his wife, hey, can I take some cash from your wallet to go get yogurt? She says, yes, of course. He then leaves, gets into his car, and drives. According to his wife, he was in incredibly good spirits that night, very happy, and it just didn't add up that he would just suddenly, out of nowhere, do this. So his wife hires basically a private investigator and also has a secondary medical examiner, you know, take a look at this case. The medical examiner determined that the gunshot wound to his forehead was fired from at least two inches away, if not maybe four inches away. What's unusual about that is that when most people do this kind of thing, they either take the gun and put it directly to the side of their head and typically they press it into their skin. But he did not do that if, if he did this to himself. Doing it from the front, from afar, is definitely, it's not normal. Not to say it can't happen, because it does, but it's just unusual. Looking into Michael's medical records, he had no medical issues whatsoever. He was in perfect health, so it's not like he was dying of anything. He was not in therapy. As a matter of fact, he had a very clean mental health record. He had no signs of anything. His marriage was wonderful. They had an absolutely happy marriage. He was a phenomenal dad. He loved his child. 
They looked into his financials. Nothing out of the ordinary. He was in no financial disarray whatsoever. Everything about his life was good. It was comfortable. It was more than comfortable. He was happy. He had a wonderful family. He was about to retire. He had a damn good career. And it's really the scenario that played out at the gas station, too, that's just so strange. First of all, why did he bother taking cash from his wife's purse when she, you know, he asked her if he wasn't planning on buying yogurt and bringing it back home? Also, why would he stop at the gas station and start to fill up his car? What would be the point if he was planning to end his own life? As one person was interviewed said, it's like no one does this. No one's like filling up their gas tank and planning to go get some yogurt and then says, you know what? I'm actually kind of bored. You know what I'm gonna do? Kill myself. That doesn't happen. Can it happen? Yes, I'm just saying it doesn't happen. It's not a normal thing. His wife, Barbara, fully believes that he was murdered. As do some of the people he worked with at the sheriff station. And also his brother, who was a pastor or a priest, said that he, Michael, there's no way. Michael was also a very devout religious man and ending your own life like that is completely against the religion. Because of his such positive and loving relationship and connection to his wife and his child, his family, no one can understand why he would do this to them. Just out of nowhere. But also, why, I mean, the gun was found in the correct position it should have been found in if he shot himself. Why did he have the flashlight, though? What was he trying to see? There, sure, there's no signs of, like, footprints in the dirt, no signs of anyone else being there, but also that doesn't mean anything because there could have been people there that just didn't leave any trace behind. There were witnesses who said they heard the gunshot, a single shot, but none of those witnesses heard an altercation or arguments or anything. And the police are taking that as a sign of, See, there you go. No one, he wasn't, this wasn't a murder. But what if he was accosted by someone who told him not to say anything or scream? What if that person came up to him and said, I'm going to shoot you if you say anything, and did so quietly? That is also very possible. But then it comes to who? Why? Well, the biggest theory is his own history with taking down many members of the mafia. That even though it happened 20-ish years prior to this case happening, you know, they're going to hold a grudge. They're going to have a vendetta against him. And this could have absolutely been retaliation. And they would have known precisely how to do this and make it look like something that it wasn't. If anyone can make this look like a suicide, but it actually was a murder, it would probably be the mafia. But allegedly, police have no evidence to connect that. They have no evidence whatsoever that this was a murder. So the only conclusion they can come to is that he did it to himself. It just... And I know that people, if they're planning to end their own life, a lot of times they do show a lot of signs of, of happiness right before. I mean, it could be the same thing that happened here. But the other things just don't add up. Did he want it to make it look like a murder? By, you know, staging the car like that at the gas station? And maybe telling his wife, I'm gonna go get yogurt, where can I get some cash? Maybe he wanted to make it look convincing. He was a cop, he did study at the FBI. There is that possibility that he knew what he was doing. But why would he do that to his family? his child. And so really, this ultimately ends as a mystery. The police say this case is closed, that this was a suicide, that's it. Despite many other people believing that he was murdered. Unfortunately, his wife Barbara passed away in 2022, never really finding out if her hunch was right. And it really sounds like the police want nothing more to do with this. And unfortunately, the truth behind what really happened to Michael O'Mara that night may remain unsolved forever. Hello, true crimer-ers. This is the case of the Nevada Tan murder. Viewer discretion is advised. This particular story happened here at the Okubo Elementary School, which was located in the Nagasaki Prefecture in Japan. It was June 1st, 2004. 12-year-old Satomi Matari was there that day, and it was during the lunch hour when her and another student suddenly went missing. Well, Satomi never arrived to the classroom she was supposed to attend after lunch. But the second girl, who was referred to as Girl A for some time, she did return to class, but she was covered in blood. Around the same time, a discovery was made. In one of the classrooms, which was empty, they found the bloodied body of Satomi. The 12-year-old girl's neck had been slit from end to end, and her arms had also been cut. The murder weapon was a box cutter. 
So before they released officially the identity of the girl who committed the murder, all they really had in the public was this photo. And this one right here is Satomi. And then this is the girl who actually committed the murder. She was wearing a sweatshirt that said Nevada on it. And apparently tan was the pronunciation children would use for the suffix chan. So they nicknamed her Nevada Tan. And this would become the Nevada Tan murder. So what the hell happened? Why did this happen? How did a, another 12 year old girl come about murdering another 12 year old? Well, according to her, she said it was because um, Satomi said not so nice things about her on the internet. She alleges that the victim slandered her, called her names like a goody goody and made fun of her weight and appearance. And that was enough, I guess, to kill her. So Nevada Tan was taken into custody and because of laws at that point in Japan, they were really, really, really light on sentencing and she confessed to it. But because of her age, they the courts decided to institutionalize her and they sentenced her to a reformatory. Initially, her sentence was just two years. But after that two years was up, she was actually extended an additional two years because I guess she hadn't officially been reformed yet. On May 29th, 2008, she was officially released from the institution and the courts and the authorities said they were no longer going to seek any additional sentencing for her. And she was free. She would later be diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. This created a major debate in Japan about should people of that age get light sentences even though their crime is horrific. I mean, she did this with intent. She made a decision based on her reaction to how she believed she was being treated online and in school. And she even later confessed to it and she apologized for doing it. It's, I mean, you guys know my opinions on this type of thing. Uh, personally, I think kids who commit murders, intentional homicides should be treated just like an adult should be treated. I know there are going to be instances and cases where there are special circumstances, but this really wasn't one of those. But also it's a different country than here, so. Satomi so was granted a posthumous uh, certificate of graduation at the end of the school year. I don't know, but to me, it just doesn't sound like she really got justice at all. Justice for Peyton is a TikTok page I would like for you all to follow. I have not covered Peyton's case yet, but her case is on my list to cover at some point. As you all know, I, I pick my cases at random when I cover them. But I would, in the meantime, like for you guys to check out this page. Um, in the description below, um, I have tagged a recent video as well as just the page itself. Peyton Houston was last seen alive on December 20th, 2019. She left the Tin Roof Bar in Birmingham, Alabama with two men. In January of 2020, her remains were found buried in a shallow grave. Now, one man has been arrested for abuse of a corpse. However, it sounds like police are trying to claim that Peyton died of an accidental overdose. But there appears to be, based on what I'm reading here and seeing in their videos, there appears to be more than that. Peyton had texted a friend that night. She said, quote, if I call answer, I don't know these people and I feel in trouble. And she was found wrapped up in sheets, buried in a shallow grave. That sounds like the makings of murder to me. But at any rate, please go follow this page. Um, give their videos a like. Again, like I say, do not spam like their videos because that actually ends up hurting their pages. Leave comments that are usually more than five words. Share the video on Facebook, Instagram, wherever. And if you hit the little... Uh, button down here then you can hit the little yellow repost button it takes just a couple of seconds of your day that way more eyes can get on this page and so hopefully one day very soon um, peyton's family will get the justice she rightfully deserves an unknown killer laid in wait on her porch until the opportune moment hello true crimeers this is the case of paula ivy george viewer discretion is advised paula sue ivy george was born on october 8th 1968 and she was born and raised in Texas. Paula was one of three kids in the family. She had a sister and a brother, and eventually the family would relocate to Oklahoma. She would go on to have three children, three sons, and they were her entire life. Paula was all about her family, taking care of her boys, and also animals. She loved animals. She was someone who would stop doing whatever she was doing if you needed help, and she would help you. 
She was also very outdoorsy. She loved going fishing and camping and all that kind of stuff. Raising three boys will probably, you know, help with that. And at the time of this case, she's actually working as an electrician there in Oklahoma. She was living in a very rural location on Kiowa Road in Highway 132. This was not like a neighborhood where it was, you know, house and house and house and house and house. It was property separated by a lot of land. Someone had to have known she lived there. So at some point between the late night of April 30th, 2013 and the very early morning hours of May 1st, 2013, Paula, they know, was in her bedroom when suddenly a few gunshots rang out. 43-year-old Paula Ivy George was shot, and by the time anyone found her, she was unfortunately already deceased. Based on their investigation, they determined that whoever did this did this while sitting on her porch. So they were outside of her home on her porch waiting for her to get to her bedroom. They then fired these gunshots through a window or the wall on purpose trying to hit her and they succeeded. The killer, however, left no trace of themselves behind, as far as I can tell. I don't see any mention of like shoe impressions in the dirt. I don't see any mention of fingerprints or DNA. So I don't know if they have those things and they're not sank just to keep it close to them, or if they legit just don't have anything. All they know is that Paula was murdered. And even though the area was really remote, police were still hopeful that perhaps someone heard something. Because this was a, an area where there was a lot of oil, like oil fields, people working on these fields. But they interviewed people from all over this you know, portion and they got nothing. Allegedly, apparently, nobody heard or saw anything. Nobody heard the gunshots. So that's why they don't know exactly when it happened. They know she was alive sometime around 10 p.m. But from that point, they're just guessing as to when it actually occurred. It did seem like a surprise, like she, the, the person wasn't in the house. So they had no witnesses, at least none that have come forward. They have no physical evidence which means they have no persons of interest. They have no suspects. I imagine they've looked into her life and maybe her job. I'm sure they looked into like her love life, perhaps the father of her children. I'm sure they've done that work. I just don't exactly see how thorough or what they've done actually. But police do believe that she was the deliberate target of this murder. This was premeditated in their mind. Because of the location of the house being so rural, because they knew where her bedroom was and they knew to where her bed was, they knew where to shoot. They had an intimate knowledge of her home. But the problem is, why? What's the motive? Nothing was stolen. She wasn't sexually assaulted. The killer was never even in the house. And unfortunately, it's just a mystery. Whoever did this to her likely knew her in some capacity but police have not been able to suss out exactly who that person is. But somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth, and perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information on the murder of Paula Ivy George, please call 580-395-2356. He didn't like his student's performance, so he did this evil thing. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Rex Copeland. Viewer discretion is advised. Rex Bartley Copeland was a student here at Samford University, which is located in Alabama. At the time of this case, he was 20 years old. He was going to law school, and he also just so happened to be a great debater. He was on Samford's debate team, and he excelled. He was phenomenal at it. Apparently, this school is one that takes um, a lot of pride in their debate teams. And while Rex was really good at doing this, he also, this wasn't his passion. He really wanted to focus his attention on law school. And also, he's 20 years old. He wants to enjoy the frat life. But his debate teacher or instructor, William Slagle, was apparently incredibly demanding. He expected nothing but the absolute best and perfection from everybody. And so it got to a point where he was noticing that Rex, his star debater, was, he just, it, he wasn't living up to his standards. Now, Rex Copeland lived in an apartment complex off of campus called Hunter's Point. And it is there on September 21st, 1989, that his body was discovered. He had been stabbed a whole bunch of times. 
there was blood all over the place. It was more than evident that whoever did this tried to wipe down counters and what, tried to clean up the blood, get fingerprints off of things. This person took time to attempt to clean things up, to hide themselves. And the community, the school, his family, his friends were all just devastated. This was so unexpected and nobody could know why this happened to him. What was this about? He wasn't robbed. There was no forced entry. He wasn't in any kind of relationship. Nobody knew why this happened. William Slagle, meanwhile, is consoling his other students about this murder, trying to comfort them. He goes to Rex's funeral and he's there to support Rex's family, give condolences to his family. There was one thing that they found at Rex's apartment and it was on his answering machine. It was a message from William Slagle. And that message was him asking Rex to please come attend more practice sessions. But at first he wasn't considered a suspect. Several days after the funeral, William Slagle sends a letter to the local police. He confesses he was the one to kill Rex, but he doesn't turn himself in. He goes on the run. He wants to run away from what he did. But after about six months on the run in April of 1990, William Slagle turns himself in. He has a story. He says he was incredibly intoxicated that night when he went to talk to his student Rex. He says they got into an argument and Rex did something, which then prompted William Slagle to retaliate in self-defense. The problem though, is that Rex wasn't stabbed once or twice. Rex was stabbed 22 times. 22 times is not self-defense. These were deep wounds. And also the, the house had been cleaned. Fingerprints had been wiped. Doorknobs had been wiped clean. Blood was attempted to be cleaned up. He clearly meant to hide his involvement. He took time. And he tried to say, well, I mean, I was too drunk. There's no way I could have done this premeditated. Well, a jury would end up disagreeing. What the prosecution presented was that Rex was done. He was fed up with the pressures that William Slagle was putting on him to continue competing in these debates when that's not what he wanted to focus on. He was trying to move away from the debate team. But William Slagle, being the person he is, the perfectionist, he needs to have the absolute best debate team. And his star pupil is wanting to leave it and he's standing up for himself. So what they believe is that William goes to the house, he starts a confrontation, and then he just stabs Rex 22 times. Then he cleans up the apartment, he goes back to his office, where he then calls Rex's phone to leave that message on the answering machine to make it look like he was never in the apartment that night. He was the only viable suspect, and he confessed to doing it. It's just a matter of whether or not they believed he did it in self-defense, or if he just killed him out of his own rage. Well, he was found guilty of murder. They did not believe the self-defense story. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole, which he was denied parole in 2001 and 2007. And then in 2010, he dies in prison. And ultimately, Rex Copeland got the justice he rightfully deserved. She was thrown off a 2000 foot cliff to her death. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Sherry Hart. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Sherry Hart was a 24-year-old mother to a six-year-old daughter, and her daughter's name was April. According to everyone in her life, Sherry absolutely adored April. She was the best mom a young girl could possibly ask for. And at the time, Sherry was a single mother because she had uh, divorced April's father. On January 15th, 1984, Sherry Hart vanished. Sherry was supposed to meet a man for a date that night, and that was going to be in Ash County, North Carolina, where she lived. According to what police would find out from witnesses later on, the date never showed up. Sherry was seen by a couple of her friends that night, though. But she never got home. And she just seemed to fall off the face of the earth. Her six-year-old daughter started to grow up without her, thinking that her mom abandoned her and that her mom didn't love her anymore, that she didn't want her anymore. Because she didn't understand why her mom was just suddenly gone. Rumors began to circulate that she just ran off with some lover and moved to Florida. But the truth of the matter is, is she was not far from home at all. So this is a place referred to as the jumping off point or jumping off rock. 
and it's in the Ashe County, North Carolina area. It is extremely scenic. It's a beautiful view, and just below is a somewhat, somewhere around a 2,000 foot drop. 11 months after Sherry seemed to disappear, she was found. She was found at the bottom of that 2,000 foot cliff. At that point, her body was very badly decomposed and she was primarily just skeletal remains. But it was the fall that killed her. She died from severe blunt force trauma, meaning she was alive when she fell off that cliff. They just didn't know if she was forcibly pushed or thrown off that cliff or if she jumped on her own accord, or if she fell on accident. Well, witnesses would then come forward to police that Sherry, on the night she would have last been seen, was with two of her old classmates. This is a photo from years later, but one of them was a man named Jeffrey Burgess, and the other was this man here, Richard Bear. Jeffrey Burgess would essentially confess, I guess you can say, to police. Once he found out, they knew that he was with her that night. He said that at some point that night they met up with Sherry and the three of them got into a car and they began driving around, just laughing and having a good time. At some point, Sherry needed to use the restroom so she had them stop the car. She got out, went into the nearby woods to do that. But then Richard Bear decided to follow her into the woods where he attempted to have sex with her. She said no and she resisted and she ran from him and then he chased after her. According to Jeffrey Burgess, he was standing outside the car when he saw the two of them running towards the car. And that's when uh, Richard Bear took out a 38 caliber gun and he whacked it over Sherry's head, knocking her out of conscious temporarily. They then drove to the jumping off rock where Richard Bear forced Sherry out of the car who was now alert and awake, struggled to get her towards the edge of the cliff. And this is all according to Jeffrey Burgess where Richard Bear just told Sherry goodbye and then he threw her from the cliff he calmly and coldly just said goodbye and she fell nearly 2,000 feet to her death so they needed to confirm some of the information that jeffrey was telling them so he actually took him to the spot where where richard had tried to sexually assault sherry because that was about a quarter of a mile away from the jumping off rock when they got to that area they actually found belongings belonging to sherry like her checkbook amongst other personal items that they were able to identify as belonging to her. So they knew he was telling the truth, at least some variation of it. So he was arrested and he was charged in connection to the murder. Richard Bear was also arrested and also charged with the murder directly. Four months later, Richard Bear escaped from jail awaiting his trial because they knew he was the actual killer and that Jeffrey was just a mere bystander who didn't do anything to stop it, but they were confident that he was not the actual murderer. He was released on bond and his trial was pending until they could find Richard Bear. But Richard Bear was never found. He still hasn't been. In 1993, Richard Bear was spotted in Delaware. They confirmed he was actually there, but before the FBI could get there, he had already escaped again. In 2002, police were notified of a man uh, who they thought may be Richard Bear. They took that man's fingerprints and compared it to Richard's, but it wasn't him. They have had tips over the years about where he may be. They've gone to check on those tips, but either confirmed it wasn't him or that man, whoever it was, had already fled. He has always managed to escape the clutches of the police and the FBI. Jeffrey Burgess never went to trial for his portion of the murder. And he was simply a key witness in Richard's murder trial. But the charges against him weren't exactly strong. And they were supposed to, I guess, have the trial together. So he was never really brought back in. And in 2012, he died. And Richard Bear is still out there somewhere. Maybe. He also could be dead. There's really no way of knowing. Some people have speculated recently that he's moved back to Ashe County, North Carolina and is now hiding in plain sight. Age and time has made him look different, but that's only a rumor. Richard has never been caught. Sherry's daughter April is now a full grown adult at this point and she now has three children of her own and she is still looking for her mother's killer. And also she you know, would find out that her mom never abandoned her and never left her because she was killed but she is still awaiting justice. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Richard Bear, please contact your local FBI office with any information you have. You can report information anonymously. You do not have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. He would be about 60 years old today if still alive, which of course he could be. So if you know where he is, please contact the FBI immediately. 
In 1980, a man was found brutally murdered right here in this spot, and to this day, his case remains unsolved. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Simon Bose. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Simon Bose was 54 years old. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that last name correctly. I'm basing that pronunciation off of a video I watched. He was happily married and he had two adult children at the time this case occurred. Simon was a very talented photographer and he was very, very involved in the art scene in Auckland, New Zealand. People in his life described him as a larger than life type personality. He could be a bit argumentative and a little bombastic, they described him as. But at his core, he was a really, really nice guy and a wonderful dad and a wonderful husband. And he seems to be really well respected, especially in the photography and art scene. And then suddenly one day, someone took him from the world. It was April 4th, 1980. It was Good Friday. The 54-year-old man was spotted at the Leopard Tavern, which was located in Freeman's Bay. Then he made his way to a place called La Cava Lounge which was on Custom Street East. It was reported that he interacted with at least three different groups of people at the La Cava Lounge. Then he called a taxi, and according to the taxi driver, he was dropped off at about 2.25 a.m. on Simons Street. About 30 minutes later, a resident living here in this area called 111, which is their 911, they called because they heard the sound of a loud argument, possibly the sound of a fight, and then the sound of cars driving away fast. And it was coming from here at Gribblehurst Park. When police arrived at the park, they found a person on the ground, specifically in, the, I guess, the parking area um, right here in this exact spot and the man who was lying there was pronounced dead at the scene. He had been violently assaulted. He was beaten. He had a lot of injuries to his face and his head. The victim was identified as 54-year-old Simon Bose. Now, later that same morning, two 15-year-old boys were arrested for allegedly stealing a car. When they were talking to police about the stolen car, they had said something about that they had gotten into a fight at Gribblehurst Park. So to police, one plus one is two. They must have been the ones to beat Simon to death. So they were arrested and charged with his murder. However, six days later, the two teenagers were released and charges were dropped. The evidence against them was reviewed and they realized that they didn't have a case. I'm assuming they were able to rule those two boys out, but I'm not 100% sure. Police did interview a lot of people, and especially people who lived near Gribblehurst Park. So first there was a sighting of a car that looks like this, a Mark I Ford Zephyr. There was also a sighting of a car described as an FJ Holden. It might have been white or a really light yellow color. It was dark, so they really couldn't get the best look at it. But these vehicles were seen speeding away essentially from the where the murder happened. And this would line up with the 111 call where they stated they heard the sound of a fight and then a car speeding away. And then now people had seen the car speeding away. They have no idea if the people driving these cars at that time had anything to do with Simon's murder. They have always just wanted to talk to these people. They have never come forward. The people who drove these vehicles may have critical pieces of information, just witness statements, not necessarily the guilty parties, but th that's where they're stuck at. It's been four decades and the murder, which again occurred right here in this spot, still remains unsolved. They are hoping against all hope that somebody, anybody out there can remember something. Do you know anyone who in the early 80s was driving a vehicle that looks like this? Do you recall anyone telling you stories about how they got into a fight at Gribblehurst Park? Somebody somewhere has got to know the truth. And perhaps that someone is you. Now is the time to come forward. Now is the time to give answers to Simon's family and to give them some sort of peace and for them to get justice. If you have any information about the murder of Simon Bose, please call, and this is obviously a New Zealand phone number, 0800-2653-2273. If you know anything about his murder, please come forward. Whether this was an occult killing or something completely different, the mystery still remains. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Stephanie Coyle. Viewer discretion is advised.
At the time of this case, Stephanie Coyle was 74 years old, and she lived here in this apartment building in Arnold, Pennsylvania, on her own. I believe her husband had passed away years prior, and I know that Stephanie had at least one son. Stephanie was just, you know, a sweet old lady. She was a good person. And while she was still working, she was also just trying to have a peaceful, quiet life. Just to enjoy the rest of her time on this earth with her family, her loved ones, and... She had no enemies, like, why someone would do this horrible thing to her, still, nobody knows. It was July 16th, 1993, the day prior, Stephanie did not show up for her job, which was very unusual. And so the following day, her landlord would go to check on her. And when they opened the door and walked inside, it was a bloodbath. 74-year-old Stephanie Coyle had been repeatedly stabbed. And Cyril Wecht, the renowned pathologist who would do the autopsy, did determine that she had been sexually assaulted. And there was a very bizarre symbol carved into her back. It was some occult style symbol, they said. Exactly what that symbol is, I'm not 100% sure. Like visually, I don't know. He just basically described it as a circle with some kind of line through it. And he found that Stephanie had two different clusters of stab wounds. Each one of those clusters was six stabs. The symbol on her back is their biggest clue, but it also may mean absolutely nothing. It could have just been something the killer did to throw people off, or this was some sort of occult killing. The home wasn't ransacked. There was no forced entry. Police in their investigation would have like her family go through the apartment and there were valuables uh, out in the open that were not taken. Plenty of things small enough that a person could have stolen and sold but they left him there. So they know robbery wasn't the motive. Was sexually assaulting a 74-year-old woman the motive? They don't know. Stephanie just seemed like such a random victim. She caused no issues in anybody's lives. She wasn't in any kind of arguments with anyone. There was no bad blood with her or anyone else. She was a very just quiet, living a peaceful life. So who the hell would do this to her and why? It's now several decades later and there's still no answers. This is her son, Dan. And he is still just trying to beg police, like, what? where are you guys with this? What do you have? What evidence are you retesting? He would end up hiring a renowned private investigator named Ken Maines. I'm sure a lot of you have seen him before. He actually is on the History Channel. And I guess in his investigation, he identified several suspects. Those suspects have not been named, though, like publicly. According to Stephanie's son, Ken has named several names, at least three or four, and he's even shown pictures of those suspects to him. He also said that those, some of those suspects, not all of them, but some of them were involved with devil worshiping and had some connection to the occult. Some of them heavily involved in devil worshiping, he said. So the symbol carved onto her back, it may be legit. This may have been some sort of ritual. And from what I have read, they did find some DNA at the crime scene that did not match Stephanie or like anyone in her life, like her son or anything like that. And that they have done the genealogical DNA testing with those. But her son says that was done two and a half, three years ago. And police haven't followed up on it. They haven't announced any suspects. They've done apparently, allegedly nothing with it. So I don't know if they did that and then they got a suspect but they cleared him i don't know it sounds like he has been kept out of the loop himself and ken mains has helped you know provide here's a list of suspects these are the people who were involved with devil worshiping and the occult take a look at these guys but the case remains unsolved this is still a cold case there is a ten thousand dollar reward for anyone who could help identify her killer and if you want to report your information anonymously you can because somebody somewhere out there knows the truth, and perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information on the murder of Stephanie Coyle, please call 724-830-3949. He just threw her body in an alleyway behind a hotel, and to this day, he has never been found. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Tammy Lynn Jarvis. Viewer discretion is advised. This case occurred in 2001 here in Fort Smith, Arkansas. 27-year-old Tammy Lynn Jarvis was born in 1973, and at the time of this case, Tammy is basically doing uh, sex work. She was living here at the Garden Lodge in Fort Smith, Arkansas, which is located between 10th Street and 11th Street. It was May 26, 2001, and it was broad daylight when this occurred. 
Witnesses saw a white pickup truck pulling up in an alleyway behind the garden lodge and throwing somebody out of that truck. The witnesses saw that person then walk a few steps and then collapse. This is not the exact truck, by the way. This is just a Google image thing. This so happens to be a white pickup truck who was there. But the witnesses then saw the truck basically speed away. And the witnesses were more concerned about helping the person who had just been thrown out of the vehicle. And that person would later be identified as 27-year-old Tammy Lynn Jarvis. She had a gaping wound in her chest and she was covered in blood. An ambulance was called. She was rushed to the hospital, but unfortunately she would be pronounced deceased. Tammy did suffer one single stab wound directly into her heart. They don't know if this occurred inside the truck or if it occurred somewhere else and then she was put into the truck and then thrown out of it. They're not 100% sure. But this person was bold because it was the middle of the day and people were out walking around. In terms of the truck, they can really only kind of give a vague description of it being a white pickup truck with like a blue trim around the sides of it. And it had Oklahoma plates, but it all happened so fast that nobody really paid much attention to the license plate number. People in Tammy's life would say that a few days prior to this, she had been seen um, having a very large argument with a man. The man that people saw her arguing with, I guess they didn't really know who he was, but they saw that man a couple days prior to this getting into a white pickup truck with a blue trim around it. Now, the problem here, and this is unfortunately the case all over the country and all over the world, really, because Tammy was basically doing sex work at the time, the police didn't really take a proper report, and they really didn't give her case much attention at all. In fact, there's very little coverage of her story, as is often the case with women who do sex work. And so there's this, this kind of like feeling going around, well, eh, who cares? And so because of that, there's really no information, anything else about her case. I don't know if they have any genuine suspects. I don't know if they've interviewed people. I don't know if they have physical evidence like DNA, fingerprints, anything. They've never found the truck and they've never apprehended anyone. And Tammy Lynn Jarvis's murder is still unsolved. But somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth. And perhaps that someone is you. Please remember that Tammy Jarvis was a human being. She was a living, breathing person. She had a family and she doesn't deserve to be treated like garbage. But the man who killed her, that's exactly how he treated her. Like she was just a bag of trash that he threw from his car. So if you have information about her murder, please call 479-709-5100. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. So this story happened in China and it looks like it happened back in the February of 2017 timeframe. I don't know if this is the exact precise ride, but this is a similar at least ride that this happened on. It was called the Travel Through Space ride. And I know that I blurred out the video in the beginning and I'll show it again, but I, I can't show that video for obvious reasons. But the ride, when you do look up the video, it spins like this whole thing spins really fast while you are strapped into it. So not only does the whole arm swing, it looks like the actual thing you're sitting in is also spinning. Well, on that day in 2017, a ride goer got onto the ride. It was a packed ride. People were there waiting in line and recording and they captured something horrific. As the ride began its kind of rapid spin, a teenage girl slipped out of her seat and was literally like hanging onto the ride by her foot. And she actually flings several times with the ride. So she is swinging in a complete circle while this thing is spinning like crazy. And then eventually it releases her and she launches into a steel barrier over here. This is the steel barrier she landed on and you can see it completely, you know, bent it in. And then she slammed into the concrete. From the get-go, she was obviously not responsive, but she was still technically alive. Uh, so they had uh, rescuers come there and they brought her to a hospital. But unfortunately, there was just no way she was going to survive. I'll play the video again, but again, it's going to be blurred. But you can at least get some idea, kind of. And you can look this up as well. But you can see how it spins. 
What I do know is that every theme park in China that had this ride or something similar to it, um, that ride had to be shut down. And then the family of the teenage victim, who was their only child, the theme park compensated them with the equivalent of 127,000 US dollars, which is nothing for losing their only child. Time and time again, I see stuff like this and I, I thank my, myself for never going on rides like this or any kind of roller coaster. I am way too much of a wuss. But then seeing stuff like this, I'm like, yeah, no, I'm good. What exactly happened, by the way? I'm not 100% sure. She, it seems like she slipped out of her harness. But I, I don't know. It sounds like the theme park was held somewhat responsible for it. But no one received any criminal charges from what I can tell. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Valden Keith. Viewer discretion is advised. I don't really have many actual photos from this case, so most of what you're seeing is going to be the recreations from Unsolved Mysteries. It was November 27th, 1985, and it was in Greenville, South Carolina. A one-time convicted drug dealer named Rusty Corvette, whose actual photo I cannot find, along with a man named Sam Wadke, who had just been paroled after he had committed an armed robbery in years prior. This is the Sam Wadke portrayal. But the two of them entered this grocery store planning to rob it. Normally, people don't rob stores like this when they're super busy, but they figured it was right before Thanksgiving, the store was going to have a lot of cash. Waiting in their car was Sam's son. His name was Richard Wadke. Again, photo I cannot find. So Sam Wadke and Rusty Corvette, what a name that is, force everyone in the store to get onto their stomachs and go towards the back of the store. And then at gunpoint, they take all the cash they can get. In the end, they would have taken about $8,000. They then escaped the store, got into the car, and they took off. Immediately after they took off, two people from the store ran outside to get their license plate number. By the way, folks, uh, don't do this. I know many retailers, like I've worked at like uh, retailers where if you do this, you're fired. You take one step out of that door after someone who just robbed you, you're done. And that's for safety reasons because they had guns. They could have shot both these dudes. Anyway, side rant over, <laughs> but police were called. One of the first uh, officers to respond was officer Dennis Eubanks. And in the car with him that night was a volunteer constable. His name was Valden Keith. Valden Keith was 46 years old. He was happily married, and he was a father to four children. Their police vehicle managed to catch up with the two robbers, but Sam Wadke, who was driving the car, said, we're going through him. He takes out a gun, and he begins to fire at the officers and the car, and they managed to actually escape the scene. Valden Keith was not so lucky. He had been shot multiple times while still in the passenger seat of the car. He was there on a volunteer basis that night. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Within two days, Sam Wadke, Rusty Corvette, and Richard Wadke were all arrested. They were all charged with connection to the robbery. Sam Wadke, while in prison, he tried to scheme with Rusty Corvette to throw his own son under the bus. He literally came up with a plan to state that it was actually his son Richard that fired the fatal shots, when that wasn't even the truth. But he was willing to put his own son away forever for it. Now, Rusty Corvette told him he agreed to do this, but at trial, Rusty Corvette turned on him and said it was him, all him. Sam Watke was like, what the fuck? <laughs> so Sam Watke was found guilty of the murder and he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Rusty Corvette was sentenced for the robbery portion and he was released after 11 years. But then in 1997, he got involved in another robbery, which ended up in a police shootout, and Rusty Corvette was shot dead. I'm not 100% sure what happened to Richard Watke, but I do know he testified against his father. Sam Watke was in prison for eight years, when on January 8th, 1994, he, along with another inmate, they were doing an unsupervised landscaping job. And they managed to break the padlocks off of this entrance to this underground tunnel. And they escaped. They also cut through several different fences, wire fences, and a steel door. They actually came into contact with some contractors who were working down there in the tunnels. But they are like, we don't want anything to do with this. And they managed to escape. So the other prisoner who escaped with him was named Danny Lail. And within about a month, he was recaptured. On March 22nd, 1996, this case airs on Unsolved Mysteries for the purposes of trying to find this wanted fugitive, Sam Watke. Literally minutes after the episode airs, 
Unsolved Mysteries gets several phone calls. So the man who speaks to Unsolved Mysteries says that a former co-worker of his named Michael G. Alman looked a lot like Sam Watke. So they look up that name, Michael Alman. Police do find that a driver's license had been issued to a man with that name in Louisiana. So they go down to Louisiana, and on March 30th, 1996, they find Mr. Elman. In fact, they found Sam Watke. Fun fact, he was the 135th fugitive caught due to Unsolved Mysteries episodes. That's pretty cool that they caught that many people, and, and more after this. So he was returned back to prison, where he was given an additional 25 years on top of his life without parole, for the escape. But in August of 2005, Sam Watke died of a heart attack. Womp womp. They were murdered in cold blood, but the mystery of who did it still remains. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Yolanda and Jay Ton. Viewer discretion is advised. Yolanda Brown, who would go by Lala to everyone, she was born in May of 1986, and she lived her life in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She was the youngest of five kids, and from a very early age, they knew that Yolanda was meant for entertainment. She had star quality from the very beginning. By the time she was able to walk, she was already dancing. She was already singing. By age 11, she was already beginning to sing professionally. By 2005, she travels to Atlanta, Georgia, in hopes of pursuing a more lucrative musical career. She ended up getting a, a break, and an artist named Life Jennings asked Yolanda to be a part of his music video. She was in the music video for the song titled S.E.X., a cautionary tale about unprotected sex. Then she would end up going on tour with Life Jennings. By 2007, she returns to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where she would start to pursue her career in a solo career, and she wanted to create her first album. When this case occurs, she is sort of dating a man named Jayton Clayton, who goes by the name Kool-Aid and he was actually also a record producer. I don't really know much about his background though, unfortunately, but I know he operated a music studio, and it, this was actually not just a studio, but it was also where Jayton and Yolanda lived. Shortly before this case happened, I think in the, the weeks leading up to it, maybe the months, there had been a break-in in, in the studio where someone stole about $100,000 worth of, of equipment, recording equipment. They never caught who did that. On October 19th, 2007, Yolanda and Jayton were going to be recording at the studio. This was after they had uh, a nice dinner with Yolanda's parents. And after the dinner, the parents dropped them off at the studio. Then they were never heard from ever again. Family and friends became concerned when they hadn't heard from them within a day or so. They would go to the music studio, but the door was locked and they would knock on the door, but nobody would come. But what was weird was that the lights were still on. The lights were on the entire time. So they go to the owner, the landlord of the building, and they say, hey, can you let us in? And they say, well, I can't do that legally without a warrant. So they go to police, they try to report the, the couple missing, just to get the ball rolling, just to get someone into that studio. But police are kind of, you know, going slow about this. So finally, one of the family members just kicks the door in, and they enter the studio themselves. And what they find is horrific. There are two deceased bodies inside the building, and they had both been dead for several days. This was three days after they were last seen alive. Kool-Aid and Lala were both brutally murdered. From what I understand, the two of them were shot at fairly close range, but there's no more details about their deaths from the coroner's report because they haven't released it. All the public really knows is that they were shot at close range. Now, the building itself, there was no forced entry, and they typically kept the building locked when they were inside of it, and they would let people in who wanted to come in. So there's no forced entry, so it means that they likely let their killer in, that they at least knew them or trusted this person or persons. But there is also that chance that maybe they just accidentally forgot to lock the door and their killer just walked in. And police were also interested in, was this connected to the robbery of $100,000 worth of equipment that happened sometime prior? It's a possibility is connected, but it's also possible that it has nothing to do with each other. They also found out that Yolanda had been receiving some threats from an unknown person in the weeks leading up to the murder. And Yolanda was at that point considering moving out of the studio and getting her own apartment. And that's because she wanted to separate herself from the business portion and her personal life. But she never had the opportunity to actually do that. Around 2017, police would announce that they have a suspect. And that suspect was then living in the Arizona area. 
but they have not released that suspect's name uh, publicly. The police say they have a strong case against this person, and so they gave everything they had to the DA in Milwaukee. However, the DA in Milwaukee has stated that they are still working on this case and that it's still ongoing, and they have never filed charges against this person. They haven't announced who it is, where they are currently, or if they know for sure this person is their killer. And since then, since about 2017, 2018, there's really no more information about this case. And it remains unsolved. But somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth. I mean, this was a relatively recent case. The person who did it is more than likely still alive out there somewhere. And so maybe they said something to you. Maybe they talked about it. Maybe they bragged. Killers love to do that. Maybe you're afraid to come forward. Well, you can always report information anonymously. You never have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. So if you have any information about the murders of Yolanda Brown and Jayton Claiborne, please contact the Milwaukee Police Department as soon as possible. Help Yolanda and Jayton get the justice they rightfully deserve.